The chair, good morning. The chair has received a request to cover this hearing in whole or in part by television broadcast, radio broadcast, still photography, or by other similar methods. In accordance with Committee Rule 5A, permission will be granted unless there is objection. Is there objection? Hearing none, permission is granted. We welcome you today to the subcommittee's hearing on H.R. 4426, a bill introduced by Mr. Frank to amend Section 105 of the Copyright Act. H.R. 4426 has two parts. The first part would prohibit copyright in names, numbers, or citations by which the text of state or federal laws are identified. The second part would prohibit copyright in any volume or page number by which state or federal laws, regulations, or judicial opinions are identified. This subsequently frequently delves into highly technical areas such as animal patenting, gene splicing, and artificial intelligence. Today's hearing, however, concerns a subject that all members of the Judiciary Committee can feel right at home with, law books. Computers are not very far away, though, and I look forward to exploring with the witnesses the way in which computers have changed the publishing and delivery of judicial opinions and statutes. We have a full slate of very qualified, interesting witnesses for what promises to be a very, very good hearing. Gentlemen from California. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Copyright Act provides copyright protection for original works of authorship fixed in any tangible medium of expression. The standard for originality is low. It is not necessary that of the work that the work be novel or unique, which is the standard used for determining whether someone is entitled to a patent, but only that the work have its origin with the author and that it be independently created. The Copyright Act also provides protection for an arrangement of pre-existing materials. Section 103 of the Act states that the subject matter of copyright includes compilations and derivative works. A compilation is defined in the Act is a work formed by the collection of assem assembling of pre-existing materials or of data that are selected, coordinated, or arranged in such a way that the resulting work as a whole constitutes an original work of authorship. One of the questions we'll be reviewing this morning is whether an arrangement of opinions, citations, and page numbers by a case reporter like West Publishing Company is or is not a copyrightable work. Mr. Chairman, this is an important issue, and I'm looking forward to this morning's testimony. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, the, uh, the author of the legislation pending before the committee, any opening statement? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the hearing. I think uh, this is an evolving area of the law, very important to the economy of the country, and I was approached, I was asked that one point, if I would offer this as an amendment, I said, while well, I thought there was a lot of merit to the argument, I did not feel sufficiently confident in it at that point to offer it as an amendment uh, at some point, and I did think it was useful to have a, uh, a hearing on it. And uh, I very much look forward to this hearing. Some hearings we come to prepared to make our arguments. Uh, occasionally, members of Congress come to a hearing to listen and be influenced by what people have to say. I think this may very well be one of those in that latter category. Uh, it's uh, useful that it's being captured on tape. It's uh, in some cases a rarity. I mean, this is not one where we have ideological predispositions or uh, uh, substantial political interests uh, one way or the other. Uh, it's an important and, as I said, evolving area of the law, and uh, I look forward to being uh, enlightened uh, by people on, on what appropriate public policy ought to be. I obviously start out with an inclination in the direction of the bill I filed, but I look forward to listening. Thank you, gentlemen. We, uh, we've been joined by a very distinguished member of the uh, full Judiciary Committee who doesn't serve on this particular subcommittee, but who we're delighted to have with us, and that's Jim Randstad of Minnesota, who has more than just a passing interest in the legislation. Gentleman from Minnesota. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for per permitting me uh, to participate in the hearing today. And you're correct. This uh, legislation is of obvious concern, a very deep concern. West Publishing is uh, one of the largest employers in my district. It's an honest company, it performs magnificently, it provides a valuable service to American consumers of legal publications. It's a proud employee-owned enterprise, and it's one of the premier businesses in our entire state and truly a model corporate citizen. No uh, 
Uh, other corporation gives more to charities, uh, nor does uh, better deeds than, than West Publishing. In my judgment, Mr. Chairman, what we're about to witness is an attack on a company for performing its job too well. I feel this attack is unwarranted. It's precisely this type of unjustified assault that has caused America to lose its competitive edge in the world marketplace. The legislation being considered today represents an effort by one of the largest and most powerful foreign conglomerates in the world, led by an English lord, to win in the United States Congress what it knows it cannot win in the courts. The courts, Mr. Chairman, have spoken on West copyrights and upheld them. I see no reason whatever for Congress to act in response to the siren call of Lord Thompson. This is, if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, naked special interest legislation. Uh, I think it's completely up to the proponents to demonstrate, and I appreciate the open-mindedness of the author of the bill, and uh, whom I uh, respect uh, uh, very uh, much and the other members of the subcommittee to truly listen uh, to the uh, testimony here today and to those not present. Uh, I believe it's absolutely imperative that they carefully review the record of this uh, hearing because it is up to the proponents to demonstrate that there's a serious problem before we strip thousands of hardworking, industrious Americans of their employment just because they've performed too well. Let me close by saying, Mr. Chairman, this legislation uh, sets us on a slippery slope and will have wide ramifications for the entire issue of compilation copyright protection. On this point, I would ask that this statement of comp compilation publishers opposed to H.R. 4426 be made part of the record. And again, I uh, would uh, implore the members of the subcommittee to read this statement of concerned compilation uh, publishers. And again, Mr. Chairman, I thank you for allowing me to participate in this very, very uh, uh, critical hearing. Thank you. Without objection, the uh, statement will be so received. Our first uh, witness this morning is Ralph Ullman, the very distinguished Register of Copyrights. Uh, Mr. Ullman was here just last Wednesday testifying on H.R. 191. He's accompanied today by Dorothy Schrader, able general counsel of the Copyright Office, who also joined us last week. Ralph, your written statement will be included in the record in full. Uh, as you know, we, we appreciate when you summarize for us so we can get right to questions, but you may proceed as you see fit. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Frank's bill would clarify that public domain elements like case names, numbers, citations, and volume and page numbers are meant to be freely accessible and not subject to proprietary rights that might inhibit commercial copying. The Copyright Office supports the general principle of this bill that copyright should not be available to protect these elements. Of course, the question always occurs, is this bill necessary? Uh, I would contend that the material covered uh, is probably not copyrightable under current law, particularly after the recent Supreme Court decision in Feist. If Congress does decide to legislate, I have two suggestions. First, the legislative history should make clear that the bill only clarifies existing law and applies to both legal and non-legal materials. Second, because of this broad application, Section 102, uh, the general subject matter section of the Copyright Act, uh, should be amended rather than Section 105, which is the government work section. Although the Copyright Act does not protect facts, a compilation of such unprotectable elements may be protected given enough original selection coordination or arrangement. Uh, for a century and a half before the Eighth Circuit decision in West Publishing versus Mead Data, no court had protected case arrangement and pagination standing alone. Original headnotes, original summaries of facts, and original summaries of holdings, on the other hand, have been held to be copyrightable, and this is the type of service that West routinely provides. The Mead data decision was a substantial departure from existing precedent. The court gave weight to equity and sweat of the brow considerations and some inherent notions of unfair competition relief, and those are compelling arguments. Even if the Eighth Circuit's decision were consistent with existing law, Feist told the death knell for creations based exclusively on sweat of the brow instead of on originality. The Constitution requires that that element of originality before copyright protection will kick in. 
Feist teaches us that even though only a modest level of creativity is required for copyrightability, that creative spark is still a constitutional prerequisite and originality is necessary in selection, coordination, or arrangement. The subject matter that the bill would exempt from copyright protection contains no more creativity than the alphabetical arrangement of names in the white pages of telephone directories that the Supreme Court concluded in Feist was, using the words of Justice O'Connor, not only unoriginal, but practically inevitable. This concludes my oral statement, Mr. Chairman. I would be pleased to answer any questions now or in writing. Uh, has the Copyright Office issued a certificate of registration to West Publishing for its national reporter system as a whole? Yes, we have, and we continue to do that. Uh, the work as a whole is uh, given a copyright certificate. Has the Copyright Office issued certificates of registration to the West Publishing Company for individual volumes of judicial reporters? We, if we do, uh, we do uh, issue uh, certificates of registration for individual volumes uh, if they're submitted in that way. Uh, the volume itself represents a, a work of authorship. Uh, it, it includes the head notes, the, uh, the uh, uh, other uh, original elements, uh, uh, not just the pagination and the arrangement of the, uh, of the uh, cases. And I should add that uh, many of the things that uh, West does, for instance, the Fed SUP, uh, requires a great deal of original selection of cases. Very few of the district court cases are actually published uh, by West. And that selection by West is entirely copyrightable under the copyright law. Any other areas in your judgment uh, uh, that are copyrightable in the West publications? Page numbers. I suspect there are uh, page numbers copyrightable. Page, page numbers are, are we, under the rules of the Copyright Office. We don't uh, uh, we don't register individual elements of a work. We register the one work. And that registration covers those uh, those uh, copyrightable elements. Uh, uh, if someone were to specify page numbers, uh, we would have to look at it, and I suspect we would request that they they change the uh, the authorship statement on the on the application form. Star pagination, copyrightable? No, that would not be. In your view, what did the certificates of registration re for each judicial opinion cover beside what what we just talked about? Well, it does cover the work as a whole, uh, and uh, I think that uh, there is uh, certainly sufficient human authorship involved with uh, the works produced by uh, by the West Publishing Company. Uh, let me ask Ms. Schrader to uh, add anything that she uh, might uh, have in mind. Uh, in addition to selection, it's possible that the arrangement of the cases, that is one case in relation to another, not the breakdown of pages, the pagination, but the arrangement, the ordering of the cases, might be the basis of originality. The Copyright Office doesn't really uh, take a position on that because we haven't uh, really required West to, or any other legal publisher, to specifically indicate uh, the basis on which they have uh, ordered their cases. But if it's ordered uh, on, on the basis of uh, some arbitrary criteria, such as uh, the uh, subject matter or um, uh, the importance of the case, possibly. Uh, that uh, might be an, an element of originality, especially, especially if there is significant uh, originality in the selection of the cases. Uh, but as Mr. Roman said, uh, each of these publications tends to have clearly copyrightable authorship, such as the headnotes, uh, and uh, the Copyright Office then doesn't go any deeper into the claim uh, in deciding to make registration. But we would exclude pagination if that element were specifically claimed. I'm from California. West versus Meade made clear, and I, I quote, that protection for the numbers is not sought for their own sake. It is sought rather because access to these particular numbers, the jump cities, would give users of Lexus a large part of what West spent so much in labor and industry and compiling. It would pro tata reduce anyone's need to buy West books. The key to this case, then, is not whether numbers are copyrightable, but whether the copyright on the books as a whole is infringed by the unauthorized appropriation of these particular numbers. We therefore hold West, the West case arrangements, an important part of which is internal page citations, 
are original works of authorship entitled to copyright protection. Do you disagree with this holding? We do uh, disagree with that holding in the Copyright Office, uh, and uh, we, uh, we think that uh, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, the Feist decision, uh, would agree with our, our uh, determination of, uh, of uh, the state of the law. That basically dealt with the, uh, with the telephone book, didn't it? Yes, sir. It's ruled that the telephone book was not a, an, original, an original work. West tries to say that they differ substantially from from uh, the, the automatic listings in the, in the in the telephone book. What, what I'm trying to get at, and I, I think some of us are uh, unclear, just exactly what does this bill do? Does it do anything? Uh, does it? Uh, uh, change what you think is the present interpretation of the court. If it doesn't, is it necessary? Uh, if it does exactly, what does it change? It does uh, clarify what we consider it to be the existence, existing state of the law on the point of uh, requirement of authorship and originality in, in a compilation. West does far more than the compilers of a telephone book do, and those things are copyrightable and they're protectable. Just the page numbers, which are so inevitable that they don't rise to the level of being the creative spark that the court requires in applying copyright protection. But the volume itself, the work product of the employees of the West Publishing Company, that is copyrightable under the U.S. copyright law. Could, I wonder for our, for our own use and better understanding, if you could, uh, if, if you, when, when you get a little time, and I know you don't get much this spare time, but could you kind of give us a, a, uh, a one-page or two-page report on just exactly what is copyrightable under, under uh, West system and what is not? I'd be happy to do because that. Because I have to admit it's a little bit un, unclear to me, and what I would like to know specifically is what this bill changes, if anything, in, in those lists that you might compile about what is and, and what isn't, because I'd like to know what we're doing. We'd be happy to do that, um, sir. Professor Joyce will testify this morning that West versus Meade was wrongfully decided, uh, and that this case clearly overrules that case, and you obviously agree with, with that. Professor Denicola disagrees with Joyce and believes that West versus Meade was correctly decided. He says in his testimony, the only use that would involve an infringement of the protected selection and arrangement of cases is the publication of a competing compilation of cases that copies the overall selection and arrangement of cases from the first compilation. The dispute to which HR 20, 4626 responds does not in any real sense involve public access to the law. It is a commercial dispute between a small number of publishers in the business of marketing compilations of cases and statutes. There is nothing unique about this particular dispute that justifies or requires special legislation of the kind presently before the subcommittee. Is there any truth to what the professor is saying? Well, that always is the risk you run when you, uh, when you uh, uh, strike down protection for something that takes a lot of time and effort and money to produce. Uh, I suppose uh, if there wasn't a tremendous amount of cross-subsidy in the production of the telephone books after the Feist decision, uh, very few people would produce telephone books unless they were required to by law in exchange for their, their monopoly uh, rights of, uh, of uh, a telephone company. In this case, uh, I think that there is uh, some uh, danger of uh, West uh, uh, not uh, continuing to do what they're doing if someone can just... Uh, rip them off after producing, uh, producing uh, all the time and effort they spent producing the work. But uh, I think that, uh, that does not uh, uh, necessarily uh, follow because so much of what they do is unique and valuable and copyrightable uh, that uh, someone who is just uh, photo reproducing uh, their work product would have to block out all of that copyrightable material and uh, what they'd be left with probably wouldn't be all that useful and uh, probably wouldn't be that marketable, so people would still continue to buy the, uh, the West publications. Should West versus Mead have been decided as a fair use case 
not just a straight copyright case. I suppose it could have been decided as a, as a fair use case, uh, and uh, that uh, that theory I don't think was pursued uh, in in the courts. Uh, Ms. Schrader says that the the district court considered that uh, that uh, theory but rejected it. Uh, but I, I would think that it would be a perfectly respectable uh, theory to pursue. Uh, whether or not the courts would buy it or not is another question. Well, so I guess this is an interesting subject because most of us that are lawyers grew up with West in our youth, at least, and, and uh, uh, it's something that's been with us for a long time. So um, this does appear to be a, a major major change in, in uh, what has been held through the years. Thank you. It, uh, it would have been... Uh, a closer question before the Supreme Court spoke so authoritatively in the Feist decision uh, when, when Justice O'Connor struck down uh, this type of uh, compilation as it in itself uh, uh, qualifying for copyright protection. But West I, I, versus Meade never went to the Supreme Court, though. Uh, no, it didn't. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, don't think, I know that Chairman and the Ranking Minority Member both referred to the familiarity of the members with the product we're talking about here. Um, in the cases of a number of us, I think that is a receding familiarity. I don't know that <laughs> too many members have been in the books uh, that much lately. We may That's have, true. We may have seen a highlighted Xerox of a page or two from time to time, but I don't think that there's been much uh, work. I appreciate your discussing the law, and obviously one of our functions is to clarify this legally one way or the other, and I think uh, that's one of the things that that uh, makes me think we ought to look at this, because it is not useful to have the law unsettled. I think you've covered that well, but let me ask now about the public policy implications, because obviously we're dealing here with a statutory fact, so that I assume people who might even agree with you as to the implication of the Feist decision might then think that we should act statutorily to overturn that. Um, What's the public policy implications, assuming either that we pass this bill or that you are correct in your interpretation of what the court would do, the Supreme Court? Um, what then happens? Would West stop uh, doing this, do you think? That is the public policy uh, uh, consequence that you've got to look at very closely. If West stops doing this and they've got to be printed at public expense, that's certainly a... Well, yeah, I understand that. So the question is, do you think West would? I don't think so, because uh, they're so embedded in the legal system, and people have uh, become so familiar with them, and they're relied on so heavily, and their, their keynotes and uh, other explanatory uh, information is so valuable and so heavily relied on that they will continue to uh, uh, prosper. They'll continue to be a, a, a major contributor to charities in the state of Minnesota and around the country, uh, and uh, they, uh, they will not uh, suffer... Uh, uh, an economic reversal as a result of this. I don't decision. suppose a copyright has ever been made conditional on a certain level of charitable contribution. <laughs> Probably not, not a my knowledge. constitutional condition. Um, in other words, your view is that the indisputably copyrightable elements of West that would not be affected either by a Supreme Court decision along the lines of the phone company case or this bill would continue to guarantee them, or not guarantee them, but provide them incentive that people who bought it would still bought it, it would still would still want it. That is the case, and of course I am uh, thinking of uh, today uh, and uh, the immediate future where uh, people still rely on the the printed uh, books, uh, the volumes that sit on the shelf. Uh, you might want to take a closer look of uh, what the implications will be 20 years down the road when we're entirely in. Good, that was my next question: Is what are the implications of this, both contemporaneously and even more so in the future? for computer technology, and what, what would you say if we were to uh, pass this bill? Your view, of course, is that we wouldn't be changing the law much, but if, if the public policy that is embodied in this bill were to become the law of copyright, either through a Supreme Court decision that went the way you think it would go, or by this bill, what would the implications be for non-printed works in terms of copyright? Would it have any negative, positive effects? It could, uh, and not just limited to the uh, the uh, West and Mead situation, but uh, uh, the the access of uh, of uh, people to uh, 
databases uh, in, in other contexts, uh, this could have a strong bearing on, on that, uh, on that uh, uh, situation. And I would, uh, one, be reluctant to make a prediction what uh, the electronic medium is going to be like uh, 20 years down the road. Maybe uh, Ms. Schrader would be uh, a little bit... Uh, uh, yeah, because particularly I think we want to be very clear that we don't weaken, uh, and, and there is this constant tension in what we do now, which is to look at the printed works and make sure that we don't do anything that's aimed at printed works that would have a negative effect with regard to electronic. So, Ms. Schrader? Well, uh, my opinion is, uh, no, there wouldn't be that negative effect, even with the computer technology. Uh, the, the bill covers very narrow uh, elements, uh, names, uh, volume, designations, page numbers, and so on. Uh, it's been our view in the Copyright Office that the, those elements are not copyrightable, and but for the uh, decision of the Eighth Circuit in West versus Mead, we don't think there would have been a question about that. Uh, in deciding West, the court, we think, ignored earlier precedent, including a Supreme Court decision from the 19th century, Callaghan versus Myers. Uh, so uh, we don't think uh, there would be that negative impact. If there is a problem in the future, then possibly one turns to some other kind of uh, intellectual property uh, relief other than a 75-year copyright term in page numbers. You mentioned that uh, the Copyright Office is, as I said, that the Eighth Circuit case was, was incorrectly decided. Prior to that decision, were you following a, uh, w w was the office following a different policy? But we did not change our policy as a result of one decision in one circuit. Uh, so you don't follow that? Uh, what's the effect of the decision on Copyright Office policy? If, if uh, West were to submit a, uh, a, uh, an application for registration of page numbers in their, their uh, federal <coughs> citators, uh, their federal reports, uh, we would not uh, register. Right, but as you said, you don't get a piece-by-piece -piece copyright, and if you can get the whole thing copyrighted, you wouldn't do that. But in other words, the, the, your, your view is that you're not bound by what one circuit did. No. Unless I assume it was a D.C. circuit, which you might be more bound unless you moved to or, or some other state. Second, second circuit, uh, some... some, some Circuits uh, speak more authoritatively on the subject of copyright than others, but uh, as a general rule for something like this, we would uh, wait for more of a consensus to build around the country. So you're, you're not now, you do not consider yourself bound by the uh, Eighth Circuit decision? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, Mr. Ramstead. <coughs> oh, Mr. James. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll finally yield. Thank you. Uh, I'm sort of fascinated by this. It seems to me this was resolved in court and involves primarily two parties. So it, it seems to me that uh, what, the, what Lexis is perhaps attempting to do is to obtain a special act in effect <laughs> to relieve themselves from their settlement and perhaps their court judgment uh, that they effectively uh, lost. How in perhaps am I in error in that assumption or statement? The uh, arrangement, the licensing arrangement that uh, Mead ent entered into with West uh, after the decision in, in the court case in Minnesota uh, gave them access to the materials that they needed to continue doing what they were doing. I would suspect that after the Feist decision, uh, they would, uh, I don't know what the terms of the license were, but I would, I would think that they would be on much sure grounds uh, to, uh, to uh, dispense with the license and, and do what they want to do uh, without authorization from West. But uh, maybe they're, they're being genial, maybe they're, they're being cautious. Uh, they're continuing to operate under the license to do what they want to do. Well, who else <clears throat> does it involve besides West and Lexus? Uh, I know in theory it can cover a lot of people, but was it drafted specifically because of the license obligation and payments by Lexus? In relationship to West, is I that think your there, conclusion? There was a, a genuine uh, lack of clarity in the minds of some people as to what the law uh, permitted. In well, wasn't the court pretty clear? The court was, but that was just one circuit. It's not been repeated in other circuits around the country, and uh, and in many ways uh, there seems to be a consensus building the other way that uh, uh, that the uh, the Eighth Circuit uh, decision wasn't necessarily the uh, the ideal uh, uh, decision that it swept too broadly and that it should have been more narrowly uh, refined. 
what we're dealing with here is West has a particular system of head notes, okay, where they, in a case, they will sit down and, and they will describe the case in a synopsis form in front of every case, and they've done it for years, and they have a key system that keys it to that interpretation of their lawyers or their researchers. Absolutely. And uh, corpus juris secundum and, and, and most texts give you a West case site number that was prior to uh, computers was a way and a device to get into the case law regardless of the text that you were using. Is that correct? That is correct. <clears throat> and all of that the material that you've just mentioned is protectable under the copyright law. Right. No one can copy it. No one can commercially exploit it. But when you get into the computer system systems, what you in effect are doing or using that copyright uh, that copyrightable material and the issue is is whether or not you pay a license for the use and the reference to those numbers is, is that the issue what uh, what Mead wants to do is just to use the page numbers so they can they can use the uh, the West system of citation which is required by the US court system uh, and it's the page numbers not the uh, not the original material in the case notes okay. or the keynotes or the uh, summations but of the uh, rightfully or wrongfully a court has ruled in that specific case a district court and hasn't gone to the Supreme Court is that correct it was in the circuit court in the Eighth Circuit and it was appealed but uh, it was not uh, taken by the court uh, by the Supreme either side they worked out an agreement uh, they were they not agreement. yes okay but it still boils down to and the only reason it came up is because of Lexus and West having an agreement is that true or not who are the other parties that are that are, are, are uh, interested in this other computer people that want to use the west system or or I'm not uh, aware of any other parties uh, mr james that yeah. are involved uh, but uh, i suspect that it has broader implications yeah. and there are other people that would want to jump in and do what Mead is doing if okay. uh, if it were authorized uh, uh, clearly uh, by this law or by subsequent court decision is that a legitimate suspicion that i might have though that we're in effect dealing with a special act that is really designed to interfere with the specifics of a particular judgment, even though it's couched in general terms. Is that a legitimate suspicion? I would I would say not uh, in terms of the reason we're here today and why the bill was introduced. There is a genuine concern that the type of citations and page numbers which are so important to our judicial system not be monopolized by one individual company, but that uh, they, there be general access across the board in the interest of having an open society. And we're only dealing with page numbers? Only with page numbers, but uh, by locking in uh, uh, the, uh, the page numbers uh, and by allowing another company to use those page numbers, you're effectively uh, encouraging other people to do what the, uh, what the originator did uh, more cheaply, so it has important public policy implications. Uh, Mr. James, you finished? Thank you very much. Yeah, let me just, uh, I will briefly recognize myself because the gentleman was asking a question of the register that should have been more appropriately here. I, I would say yes, it was a court decision which provoked this. I would say about a third of the legislation that this committee deals with is a result of court decisions. Uh, most recently, the subcommittee which I chair is dealing with uh, legislation that was filed to overturn a couple of circuit court decisions. It was filed by the Justice Department of the United States of America, which didn't like a couple of circuit court decisions regarding the right of federal employees to bring key TAM suits. So yes, uh, as is often the case, when a statutory interpretation is rendered by a court, people who think that is poor public policy uh, resort to legislation. The notion that a specific court decision has triggered it is uh, both accurate and fairly routine. Precisely a, a legitimate point. That's why I was asking what other uh, people are involved other than the two parties to that transaction. It may well be that there, that this will this is general language. Yes. And, and oh, yeah. It applies this is a in a general bill. sense. It's not like naming the parties as no, some bills this is do. a general bill. It's, yeah. uh, but I think we, you know, that's the whole, the whole point is it's not just that one case. If it were indeed, we probably couldn't do it. It would probably be unconstitutional if we're trying to interfere with a court ruling as it relates only to two parties. But we're not here. Uh, but I, it's a statutory but, interpretation uh, that we yes, cannot. No, what I'm trying to determine is are we in substance doing that? And, and apparently we're not but I want to see what other companies are involved. In other words, obviously there's two, two companies that are primarily 
uh, you yeah, know. No, in fact, I must say my own concern in part is what are the broader implications. And as we said there, any, whenever we do do this, we, we clearly do have a, a broader implication we want to look at. Mr. Ramstad. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ullman, uh, just one question. I'm a bit puzzled by your emphasis on page numbers. Has West Publishing Company ever asked for, uh, for uh, registration to cover page numbers? No, they haven't. Uh, and uh, uh, I didn't mean to suggest that they did. They do seek registration for the work as a whole. And uh, they don't, uh, have, they have never, and I suspect they never would, uh, request the specific protection for the pagination. Mr. Chairman, uh, another uh, a question, uh, Mr. Ullman, uh, I'm also a little bit uh, puzzled. I, it's true, I haven't uh, even revisited uh, copyright law for, for quite some time. Uh, certainly never practiced in that area, but uh, I'm trying to ascertain the problem uh, which this proposed uh, solution is trying to fix uh, in a general sense uh, as a follow-up to uh, my colleagues' uh, questions. And, and based on the registrations in your office, uh, and your general knowledge, is there, is there a problem as, as to the availability of uh, this kind of material? Well, I think clearly the, uh, the material is available and uh, seems to be fulfilling the, uh, the need of the, the users. And uh, it, uh, it is uh, available in several formats now. It's available in book form. It's available uh, online from uh, the uh, electronic databases. Uh, so to answer your question, uh, there is no problem that we see that the material is uh, widely available. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, no. We say, and I, I wonder if I could, gentlemen, would, would allow me for a minute. Uh, Council has brought to my attention on page five of the complaint filed by West. Uh, on account one, copyright infringement, Count 23, or point 23, each volume of West National Report of System publications contains material wholly original to West, including editorial features, enhancements, arrangements of reports, and the numbering and paging of volumes, all of which is copyrightable subject matter. I think it should have been all of which are copyrightable subject matter, but that's not a uh, uh, major problem. But it does, at least in the complaint, uh, West was asserting that the... Uh, paging was a uh, separate copyrightable item. So while it hasn't been registered there, that has been a claim that was made and that was in the litigation. Mr. Coble, sure. can you finish? Uh, let me just ask, do you want to go to vote now? Can you want to, you I'll, want to take I'll your question? Brief. All right, then we'll this, finish and then This we'll... isn't a vote. This is a, a oh. quorum, a quorum uh, just before we go into session. Oh, it's, it's a, oh the light's out. I see yeah. two lights right there. We have 15 minutes before oh, okay. we go into session. I've got to fix the lights here. Mr. Coble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ullman, did you earlier say in response, I don't recall in, in response to whom, but that it was your belief that West would not suffer economically? Did I hear you correctly on that? I do think that they can protect their, their market niche, if that's what you want to call it, based on the, uh, the other important contribution they make uh, in the volumes that we do register for copyright. Uh, their head notes are valuable. Their case summaries are valuable. Uh, the whole uh, the whole organization of the legal uh, reporting system is valuable, and even though they won't be able to prevent someone from using their citations or <laughs> cross-referencing their page numbers, so people can use the competing service, I suspect that they will continue to prosper. From a practical point of, of view, do you see any reason for this legislation? That is to say, is is there currently a problem? to your knowledge, and based on registrations in, in, in your office with the availability of this kind of material? I think it might have been more useful uh, prior to the Supreme Court's decision in the Feist case, which made clear in my mind that uh, uh, effort, what we call sweat of the brow, was not sufficient to justify a claim to copyright. Under, that, uh, under the law prior to the Supreme Court decision, West could have claimed that pagination, the, uh, the uh, arrangement of the cases, uh, the volume numbers, all of that was, was effort, all that was work, and was entitled to copyright protection. But the Supreme Court in the Feist case made clear that that type of effort is not subject to copyright protection. So I would say that uh, the requirement for the uh, clarifying uh, uh, law uh, today is not as great as it would have been last year. One final question, Mr. Chairman. 
without the protection currently afforded uh, to unofficial compilers of legal and statutory materials, do you believe that uh, that such private publishers would would still have the incentive to publish? That's a, an important policy question that you've got to consider. Of course, we wouldn't want to uh, force uh, West to abandon this effort because people are going to copy them uh, whenever they produce a volume uh, and uh, destroy their their market. Uh, and uh, I, I would I would think that that would be one of your considerations if the government had to pick up the tab because they couldn't uh, subsidize this service uh, through sales of <coughs> volumes. Uh, that might be something you'd want to consider. Thank you. Would the gentleman yield for yes, a question? Yeah. Uh, Thank you. One, one thing, this is a, a new area for many of us, and we don't really, we haven't zeroed in on this. I'd like to know what the, the difference in size of the combatants are. The, is Lexus about the same size as West and uh, doing about the same amount of work or what? I don't know the combatants personally, and uh, I, uh, I didn't even know that uh, an English lord uh, was uh, the head of uh, Mead Data. Uh, I, uh, I would think that they're both, uh, it's not uh, like we're dealing with two vastly uh, disparate uh, entities, one with tremendous economic power, the other with uh, very little. Uh, the, uh, I would say they're, they're able to negotiate uh, on equal terms uh, with the equal economic power. Thank you. I, w I would say, uh, given the Constitution, which is still in effect in this regard, since we are, I think, a stop from granting titles of nobility, that one we won't be able to address. We'll have to try and equalize it in other ways. But the, no way we can make the head of West a baron, because I think constitutionally, <laughs> Congress is not allowed to grant titles of nobility. As I we can give them an oral letter of mark and reprisal, so they couldn't get even that way. Uh, that is a vote, so we're going to take a break. And uh, we will come back. And I think, uh, is everyone through? Can we get the register and, and the trader? Then we will come back with our next panel. We'll take a quick break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Uh, I'm just fine. Yes, Okay, the subcommittee will come to order. Our first panel consists of two very distinguished professors of law who specialize in copyright law. Professor Craig Joyce is professor of law at the University of Houston Law Center and co-director of the University of Houston Intellectual Property Law Institute. Professor Joyce is also very active in the field of legal history, including the American Society for Legal History, and in his role as an editor for the Journal of Supreme Court History. If uh, Joyce, if you'll come forward, appreciate that. We welcome you. I might also add that Professor Joyce is the original and lead author of a case book on copyright law and of numerous articles on copyright law and legal history. Professor Denicola is Margaret Larson, Professor of Intellectual Property at the University of Nebraska School of Law. He is the co-author of a treatise of copyright law. I guess the West and Thompson witnesses are not the only competitors in the legal field appearing before us today. Professor Denicola has written extensively on copyright law since 1986 has been one of two reporters for the American Law Institute's forthcoming restatement of the law and unfair competition. Uh, we welcome you. Professor, both professors had articles cited by the Supreme Court in the feist opinion, I might say. We welcome both of you here today. We're so happy you could come such a long distance to be with us today. We have your statements, which we've read and which will be part of the record without objection and you may proceed as you see fit. Why don't we begin with you, Professor Joyce. Well, Mr. Hughes, Mr. Frank, members of the committee, thank you for having me. I support H.R. 4426 enthusiastically. With respect to the terms of the bill, what I have to say about its drafting is contained in my prepared statement. My view on the merits is that but for the Eighth Circuit's two-to-one decision in the Meade case, few today would seriously argue that the identifying matter of the sort targeted in the bill, not the head notes and other conceitedly original matter discussed by Mr. James, but volume, page numbers. 
could be protected by copyright law. Indeed, if this bill were to be turned inside out and this committee were attempt to attempt to protect that matter affirmatively, I think that the legislation would contradict existing provisions of the Copyright Act, exceed the powers vested in Congress by the Copyright Clause of the Constitution, and run afoul of the Supreme Court's decision in Feist. The Meade case, however, is still very much alive. Meade itself was settled. It is now beyond review. Attempts to undo Meade in the courts have failed and will fail for the reasons in my statement. There is no realistic prospect that subsequent judicial decisions will create a split in the circuits or that the matter will be otherwise brought to the Supreme Court for its scrutiny. Thus, the error in Meade, the misbegotten notion that the identifying matter of public domain documents can be owned by a private publisher, must be corrected, if at all, by Congress. The two key issues confronting the subcommittee in deciding whether to recommend the passage of H.R. 4426, in my view, are First, are page and section numbers, etc., which identify laws and so on, protectable at all under standard principles of copyright law? My answer is no. And second, even if such identifying matter were otherwise protectable, should protection be withheld by Congress in order to enhance access to public domain documents to whose location the identifying matter refers? My answer to that question is yes. On the issue of non-protectability, I believe that the identifying matter of public domain documents protected by Mead or sought to be protected by its authority fails the most basic prerequisite of copyrightability, namely the authorship or originality test. That requirement is constitutionally mandated. The Supreme Court said in Feist, the mere fact that a work is copyrightable does not mean that every element of the work may be protected. Copyright protection may extend only to those components of a work that are original to the author. If, as Feist notes, no one can claim originality as to facts, it follows that a work for which there is a valid subsisting copyright may yet contain matter, page numbers, etc., which are not the subject of the copyright's protection. The situation just described is, I think, precisely the situation of the identifying matter which H.R. 4426 would deny protection to. This is obviously so with respect to volume and page numbers, such as those in Mead itself, which would be the subject of new subsection 105A3. The location of public domain matter within West reports is a fact. Pagination by its nature is systematic. There is no idea being expressed here that is authored. Page 700, for example, expresses nothing more than that the page comes before page 701, but after page 699. To say, as the Court of Appeals majority said in Mead, that what is being protected is the arrangement of the cases contained in the volume is to engage in factual and legal fictions. Similarly, new subsection 105A2 would deny copyright protection to names, numbers, etc. of state and federal laws. The problems which exist in the law today are exemplified by the legal purgatory in which the chapter and section numbers of legislation in my home state of Texas uh, now find themselves. Since 1925, West has numbered statutes that were not officially numbered by the legislature, that is, session laws, for inclusion in Vernon's, which is West's statutory compilation. In essence, West claims that it has created and therefore owns those chapter and section numbers. But West exercises no selectivity in determining which Texas laws to compile, nor can its claim to arrangement in assigning numbers to the statutory identifying matter be termed authorship when its choices are limited to a mere handful of options. The second question uh, I wanted to pose to you was this. Even if the identifying matter targeted in this bill were otherwise protectable, should protection nevertheless be withheld by Congress in order to enhance access? Clearly the answer is yes. Congress has no responsibility to accord copyright protection to all subject matter within its constitutional empowerment. Even if the Copyright Clause permitted Congress to accord protection, say, to the page numbers of West Federal Reporter, I think it would be a positively bad idea for Congress to do so. People of the United States have an overriding interest in readier, cheaper, easier availability of access to the law through old and new technologies alike. Whether the medium is books, 
services like Lexus or Westlaw, CD-ROMs, or technology not yet developed. The American public benefits by encouraging legal publishers to compete through innovation and service, rather than by relying on spurious claims to congressional protection of page numbers and the like, which merely identify where the law is to be found. The last word is Justice O'Connor's from Feist. It may seem unfair that much of the fruit of the compiler's labor may be used by others without compensation. As Justice Brennan has correctly observed, however, this is not some unforeseen byproduct of a statutory scheme. It is rather the essence of copyright and a constitutional requirement. Copyright protects originality, not effort. As this court noted more than a century ago, Great praise may be due to the plaintiffs for their industry and enterprise, yet the law does not contemplate their being rewarded in this way. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Joyce, Professor Denicola, welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank the subcommittee for the opportunity to comment on H.R. 4426. My name is Robert Denicola. I'm the Margaret Larson Professor of Intellectual Property at the University of Nebraska College of Law. The bill before the subcommittee apparently rests on the assumption that copyright protection for privately created compilations of cases and statutes inhibits public access to the law. I do not believe that that assumption is correct. I would like to begin by emphasizing the exceedingly narrow scope of copyright protection accorded compilations of cases and statutes under existing law. First, there is universal agreement that no publisher can claim copyright in the text of either judicial opinions or statutes. Everyone remains free to use such materials in whatever way they wish, including the creation and sale of case and statutory compilations. Second, despite occasional claims to the contrary, no publisher to my knowledge has ever claimed copyright in the citations that identify the location of particular cases or statutes within a specific compilation. Certainly no court has ever upheld such a claim. Lawyers, judges, members of the public, and even competing publishers are free to use such citations to designate the location of a particular case or statute within a published compilation. There's evidently some confusion concerning the holding in West Publishing Company versus Mead Data Central, the case to which H.R. 4426 apparently responds. The court in that case emphasized that West was not claiming and the court was not recognizing copyright protection for case citations. The court was very clear when it stated, quote, we do not agree with MDC that West's claim here is simply one for copyright in its page numbers. Instead, we concur with the district court's conclusion that West's arrangement is a copyrightable aspect of its compilation of cases. No copyright was recognized in the text of any judicial opinion, nor in the citation that identifies the location of any particular opinion or portion of an opinion. Copyright was recognized only in the overall selection and arrangement of the opinions appearing in West's reporters. What kind of use by others would infringe the copyright in the overall selection and arrangement of cases recognized by the court in West versus Mead? Use of case reporters by a lawyer quoting or citing case law on behalf of a client will not infringe the copyright in the selection and arrangement of cases. Citation to the compilation by an author writing about the law in an article or treatise will not infringe. The only use that would infringe the copyrighted selection and arrangement of cases is the publication of a competing compilation that copies the overall selection and arrangement of cases from the first compilation. The dispute to which H.R. 4426 responds does not in any real sense involve public access to the law. It is a commercial dispute between a small number of publishers in the business of marketing compilations of cases and statutes. The legal issues involved in the dispute, what counts as a work of authorship and when are the exclusive rights in a work of authorship infringed, are precisely the questions that general principles of copyright law have been successfully resolving for over 200 years. There is nothing unique about this particular dispute that justifies or requires special legislation of the kind presently before the subcommittee. For more than two centuries, the copyright laws enacted by Congress have been premised on the principle that any short-term benefits resulting from unrestricted copying of works of authorship would be outweighed by the long-term harm caused by the loss of economic incentives necessary to ensure the continued production of valuable works. What would be the consequences of enacting H.R. 4426? In the short run, permitting publishers to copy the selection and arrangement of cases and statutes that have been produced by others might result in cheaper access to such materials, particularly on the part of large law firms that rely on computer access. The long-term consequences of the bill, however, are more troubling. 
I'm not an economist, but it seems sensible to begin with the assumption that if we reduce the economic incentives to produce a particular kind of product, we will end up with less of that product rather than more. I would be particularly concerned about the continued viability of compilations of legal materials with limited markets, perhaps including materials from small states such as my own. Eventually, however, even more popular works might be affected. It has been argued that the dispute over copyright in case and statutory compilations is somehow unique because some courts require citations to the compilations produced by a particular publisher. First, let me again emphasize that the scope of copyright protection that has been recognized in case and statutory compilations does not in any way interfere with the, with the citation of those materials by lawyers in the practice of law. The argument is instead that because of the existence of such rules of court, other publishers ought to be able to reproduce and sell the copyrighted comp compilation in competition with the original producer. I do not think that it is sound policy to conclude that because a court requires lawyers to cite to a particular compilation, the publisher of that compilation should lose its copyright protection. If a public school district requires all of its eighth grade students to purchase a particular workbook because it's the most efficient means of teaching some valuable skill, we would not conclude that other publishers should therefore be free to reproduce the workbook and sell it in competition with the author. If a state university requires all of its engineering students to buy a particular computer program, we would not say that every other software manufacturer should be permitted to reproduce that program in order to compete with the copyright owner. More generally, I do not think that it is sound public policy to say that we will grant copyrights in order to stimulate the production of works of authorship, but if a particular work of authorship becomes successful, we will take the copyright away. In my view, there is nothing special or unique about the issue underlying H.R. 4426. It involves a commercial dispute between those publishers who create original compilations of cases and statutes and those publishers who would like to improve their competitive position by copying certain aspects of the other's copyrighted works. My recommendation to the subcommittee is to leave this entire dispute to be resolved under general principles of copyright law already embodied by Congress in the 1976 Copyright Act. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Nicola. Professor Joyce, uh, in your statement you concede that Wes may own a copyright in its overall selection of cases. If another publisher were to take West volume, to rip off the binding, take out the, uh, the head notes, and send the pages to a computer input company with instructions to re reproduce the entire volume in a database format, would this constitute infringement? Your judgment? Well, I, I think uh, I said, as I believe uh, the registers, that there may be um, in any work selection. I don't, I don't want to concede because I don't see selection in West's uh, volumes uh, that there is selection there. If there were selection there and the selection were to be reproduced in its entirety by someone else, yes, I think that would be an infringement. But only if they were selective? Yes. You uh, dismiss the possibility of future legislative victories by West competitors, it seems to me, in part because you believe West would preempt uh, jurisdiction by bringing suit in the uh, Eighth Circuit, referring to the uh, bankrupt Whitney case uh, brought in Texas but removed to Minnesota. Don't you think that case was removed to Minnesota because the West versus Meade case was there? Now that West versus Meade has been settled, don't you think a new suit? brought, for instance, in the Second Circuit uh, would uh, bring about a far different result than the Eighth Circuit? I don't have any reason to think that it would bring a different result elsewhere, although I hope that it would. Um, Do you have any reason to believe that it would be removed, however, to the Eighth Circuit? I, I have to tell you honestly that it's, it's been my view that there would be removal, but that I'm not an expert on jurisdiction, and I, I really can't go farther with you. Okay. Professor Denicola, would you agree that material doesn't become copyrightable merely because it's been copied? Yes, that's certainly true. Would you agree that a determination of whether a particular use harms a market for a work is relevant to a fair use defense? but is not relevant in determining whether a work is copyrightable? Uh, yeah, I think you would only reach the fair use defense if you had already concluded that you were dealing with copyrightable material. Would you agree that even if you have a work that is copyrightable, the copyright does not extend to ideas, facts? That's systems, certainly true. Systems or other copyright, uncopyrightable material? Yes, that's correct. 
seems to me the Supreme Court was rather emphatic in its vice decision in holding that if for compilations, copyright only extends to the compiler selection, coordination, or arrangement, wasn't it? Yes, I, and I think that's, that's also uh, uh, specified specifically in the 1976 Copyright Act. The court was equally emphatic, it seemed to me, in holding as a matter of constitutional law that everyone is free to copy all the facts or other unprotected material from a compilation so long as they don't copy the selection, coordination, or arrangement, is it not? Yes, I agree with that. The reproduction right is violated only by the copying of a substantial amount of expression, isn't it? That's no. true. Pagination, is that copyrightable? Uh, individual page numbers, in my opinion, would not be copyrightable, nor would individual citations. On pages three and four of your written remarks, you state that the only use that would involve an infringement of the protected selection and arrangement of cases is the publication of a competing compilation of cases that copies the overall selection and arrangement of cases from the first compilation. Please ex explain to us how the use of star pagination by an online computer service which does not reproduce the actual opinions from the first compilation can constitute the copying of the overall selection and arrangement. The Eighth Circuit uh, in the West versus Mead case uh, held, and, and I agree with their analysis, that by taking not simply individual page numbers, but by taking every page number throughout a copyrighted volume, all of the page breaks, in other words, that that was, in effect, appropriating the selection and arrangement of the cases in that particular volume. Again, I don't think the court uh, held that taking any particular citation or a small number of, of uh, citations uh, to particular cases would be infringing. They were focusing on the arrangement and selection of the cases in the particular reporter. As a practical matter, who would be interested in basically doing just that? Uh, only another uh, competitor who was interested in marketing uh, compilations of cases. Okay, gentleman from uh, Massachusetts. Thank you, and I appreciate that. Let me uh, say, and I concede my lack of familiarity, uh, selection, and obviously selection is, is uh, uh, important. Uh, with regard, am I correct that with regard to district court cases there's selection, but with regard to circuit court cases there is not? Don't they print every circuit court case, every circuit court opinion? I don't pretend to be an expert on, on all of okay. West's procedures. But if they I, did, I think, that's... I, I, yeah, I, I think it's important that to, to keep in mind that the originality uh, which the court required, for example, and, and emphasized in the Feist case, can come from the combination of selection, arrangement, and coordination. Right, well, let's do, but but mm -hmm. you've you got to do one thing at a time. Selection. Uh, assuming they were printing every opinion they could get their hands on, well, as then there would be no selection, correct? Well, for, for any particular level. volume, I assume that there still would be some selection because they do choose, for example, to put a, what if cases. What if you did them, well, I, you know, do they put them in chrono, don't they put them in chronological order? I've decided how do they, what's their order? I, I don't, don't believe that that's they correct. They don't? Okay. I, uh, they're grouped by uh, 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 the issuing court uh, in addition to Well, what if the circuit opinions, and they're all the same issuing court, aren't they? They're all the circuit court? Well, I think they're grouped by individual circuit, at least in part in the volumes. Um, but again, I would f first suggest that there would be selection uh, in that particular volume because they have chosen which particular group of cases to include. I mean, even the if they just chose, all right, we're going to start with every opinion and we start with the first case and we end it with the 11th, that that would be selection. Well, I mean, deciding how many pages it would have would be selection. If what a particular compiler did was simply to take all the material that they received and simply take enough in to fill up yes, one volume. Yes, said, I'm going to print every case in chronological order. Yeah, I, I would say that, that that probably would not be. That would not be selection. Right. I think. It would probably also not be arrangement, would it? it? Yeah, if you took them in chronological order? That's right. Probably there would not be sufficient creativity in that arrangement yeah. to justify so then, copyright. Then, I mean, so if you did that, I just want to understand what, you know, what, what's the point at which we've done enough so it's copyrightable. If you simply printed every opinion from each circuit in chronological order, uh, would you then have a problem if someone reproduced all the page numbers in that situation? And assuming you really number, you, you, like, you went 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you didn't go 1, 6, 11, 14, because mm -hmm. presumably if you had an odd pagination, that would be creative. Mm -hmm. But right. if you just did some mundane like chronological order mm -hmm. of pages. The case would turn on the application of the standard for originality that the Supreme Court talks about in the Feist case. And how would you decide it? I, I printed every case that was issued in chronological order, and I numbered 
in normal numbers. Yeah, would if, that if, be copyrightable? If that's all that went into the book, I would say that that is probably not sufficient. Not copyrightable. Well, even though, obviously, I would have to decide how long the pages would be. And you know, I could copy your decision how many words per page, et cetera. All right, the next question I have then is this, and I agree with you. You should not lose your copyright just because some other agency does something to you. Although I, I gather, do, do we do that? I'm told if we put something in the congressional record, we may weaken someone's copyright that they can take the record uh, from us. And, but, but leaving that aside, um, if the, uh, if the uh, court does do that, it creates a problem. Uh, the public policy that bothers me, and I will confess that I was not previously aware of that, maybe then we ought to be addressing that to the court. But it does bother me, and I, I do not think it is analogous to a university, it's certainly not public policy analogous to a professor saying, all right, I want you to buy this particular book. For one thing, there's much more competition. There are a lot of different professors prescribing different ones. But for the circuit court to say everybody in this circuit will have to cite to this seems to me a very inappropriate, it, it's conferring a kind of a letter patent on the, uh, on the particular publisher. And that does bother me. Now, I understand uh, maybe we ought to then say that the publisher has to consent to that. If he doesn't consent to it, uh, he or she loses it. But that, from the public policy standpoint, if a circuit court says everybody in this circuit has to cite to these page numbers, uh, that seems to me a public policy problem, does it to you? Well, I, I think we do have to keep in mind that the, the scope of copyright as it's now recognized, or as the Eighth Circuit recognized it. No, I'm not you know what? I said, I said, we're the Congress. We make laws, we change laws. I'm talking about public policy now. I'm not talking about statutory interpretation. I am bothered by the notion that a judge says, everybody in this circuit will have to buy a set of West because you've got to cite to the page numbers. And I understand it's not West's fault. That's the lazy judges, maybe, because they can't look up different page numbers. But that, that seems to me to make it beyond purely a commercial dispute between two individuals. And I mean, if this is a 14th Amendment case, it would be a state action uh, element. The judges have said, you've got to do this. Perhaps I think one of the things we're already seeing is increasing flexibility in the materials that, that uh, lawyers can books. cite to. We're already seeing forms of citation, for example, to computer databases containing opinions. But I think your instinct may be right. I mean, perhaps the, the, the issue ought to be directed towards the, the uh, Thank you. citation I'd, requirements of the court. I'd like to think I had rationalized it beyond the level of instinct, but that's, that's a that's <laughs> quibble. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General from California. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> this is a question that I'd like each of you to, to answer. Do you agree with the Register of Copyrights that H.R. 4426 is merely a class clarification of existing law? That it does nothing but clarify existing law. Do you agree with that? No, because there is confusion in the law presently. I think that if the Eighth Circuit had properly applied sections 102 and 103 of the Copyright Act and the decision had gone the other way, the law would be clear. The statutory law is not unclear, but thanks to the courts, the interpretation of the Copyright Act is. And for that reason, I think, yes, clarification uh, is useful. What would you say, Mr. Dinkle? Uh, in, in all honesty, I, I, I think it's difficult to answer because I think the impact of the legislation as now drafted is uncertain. I think it can be read in a number of different ways, and depending on how it's interpreted, it, it may or may not change existing law. I would not feel comfortable making a prediction based on the current statutory language. You, you know, if Meade is wrong, why couldn't the U.S. Supreme Court just overrule uh, the case? And I, obviously, they didn't specifically overrule it in the... In the uh, telephone book case? Well, the cert petition in Meade was on the grant of a preliminary injunction, uh, and the facts had not been developed. Um, it may well be that the court, had it thought about the matter uh, in those terms, would have said, we'll see this case again. Well, One has no way of knowing. As to Feist itself, I think there's no reason um, in that case for the Supreme Court to reach out to uh, overrule other precedents uh, in cases which have not been uh, argued uh, to it. I, I've written a very short three-page piece called Reach Out and Touch Someone, which compares the two cases and I think answers your question more fully. If, if this is a, a major problem, though, of any kind, uh, w w wouldn't there be other cases that would be taken up by the Supreme Court? So the decision there as to what the law is or, uh, would be determined? Well, I think the, the Eighth Circuit's uh, opinion has been very influential. You've heard people here today 
suggesting that it's currently the law and there's no need to overturn it. Uh, I, I do not see the likelihood immediately of a Supreme Court decision in the matter. We've received comments from three Stanford University law professors led by Paul Goldstein who state that H.R. 4426 is a bad bill. They say it's a bad bill because ambiguous at best. It threatens to destabilize a corner of copyright law that has evolved over years of careful judicial decision. H.R. 4426 central problem is that it tries and necessarily fails to convert a fact-based question that can only be asked on a case-by-case -case basis into a generalized category that can be applied across all cases. Uh, is there any merit to their statement? Well, I, I know Professor Goldstein, and I'm a graduate of that law school, so I'm not likely to say there's no merit to, to a comment by the faculty <laughs> of Stanford. Uh, in fact, I don't believe that this is a fact question, though it may, may be fact-based. Uh, the Mead Court has told us, um, in effect, although the decision is uh, in substantial part not written this way, that the um, effort which uh, West put into the compilation of uh, its reporters lends protection to the fact of the location of public domain matter within those reports. That's, uh, it seems to me, uh, both a question which can and should be resolved differently under 102 and 103 of the Copyright Act, but it's also a very important public policy question. If it is the case that West owns those page numbers, then competitors are not likely to enter the field. It's not just that the register hasn't seen attempts to register their works. They simply won't be forthcoming. My, my three-year-old likes to watch a, a television show called Star Trek The Next Generation. And there are, uh, there's a, a holographic room people walk into. Images are created. If someone in that technology sometime in the future uh, were to wish uh, to do what uh, Meade attempted to do in star pagination, uh, you can be very sure they'd be thoroughly chilled by the two-to-one decision in the Eighth Circuit. So I think there's something that, in fact, needs to be corrected. The law in this area is out of whack. Mr. Denicola? It's not clear to me that the Supreme Court's decision in the Feist case really does uh, necessarily have implications for the, the, the West versus Meade uh, result, because in the Feist case, although the court did hold that a, the white pages of a telephone book don't reflect sufficient creativity to be copyrightable, it turned right around and said, but the, the necessary level of creativity is very low, and most compilations will easily meet the standard. And so uh, I certainly would not assume and would not advise a client that the result in West versus Mead was necessarily in question because of the Supreme Court's decision. But obviously that is an issue that may well be litigated in the aftermath of the Feist case. You know, it, it just seems to me, and I, I haven't made up my mind on this bill, but it just seems to me that when an, an, a, a decision of the court that has not been overturned, uh, it's very specific in nature and deals with uh, obviously not many parties, too, basically in this case, it's kind of dangerous for us to pass legislation on, on the subject of. Uh, I'm willing to be convinced to the contrary, but uh, I, I am really, uh, really concerned about what seems to be uh, something to take care of one company's need over another, uh, and especially since the Supreme Court can uh, solve the whole thing in a future case by determining what they think the law is. You, yes, I, I would comment if I yes. could. Um, if there were no other reason to doubt the Supreme Court will take the matter, um, as you know, the court's tremendously busy on, although it's become more interested in uh, intellectual property questions recently, um, it isn't taking them by the bushel full. As to the question of, of whether this is simply a dispute between two parties, uh, I, I think there are a couple of points to consider. One, you're only seeing West Publishing and Mead Data Central because of that case itself. When someone tries to publish in ROM, that case, at least in the past, has been removed to the District of Minnesota and it dies. In Texas, when somebody else wants to publish statutory compilations, uh, they lose their cases. Uh, the state of Texas cannot establish in court because there's no actual controversy 
the right of the people of the state of Texas to own the numbers of the statutes by which they're governed. We have had since 1834 a Supreme Court decision which says that judicial opinions are the property of the people of the United States. Yeah. It's bizarre now for our law to state that nonetheless some private person can own the means by which that law is identified. That needs correction. Well, of course, as a practicing lawyer for many years, I, I know that uh, those laws can be picked up in many, many ways. And that West Publishing Company doesn't have the monopoly on that in any way, shape, or form. West has an effective oligopoly now with MDC um, uh, over a star pagination in computer-assisted legal research. It's They've been done converted. such a good job that, that, uh, that they may have put themselves out of business, it sounds like. Uh, I, I, I should add that I don't and haven't ever represented MDC. I think they may have a reasonable deal, although the settlement um, is under seal. Uh, on the other hand, in Texas, uh, we would very much like to have someone, as in Wheaton versus Peters, publishing the law cheaply, <coughs> perhaps more quickly, uh, perhaps better than it's published now. And you get that through competition. You don't get that um, through a legal monopoly. Well, it's eligible for people to develop a better system right now, isn't it? Well, uh, what's happened is that West, uh, through its Vernon's Texas Code Annotated, takes session laws, and when the legislature passes a law with respect to X, but doesn't say precisely where that goes, West slots it in, in the place uh, where West thinks it should go, and there are a tiny handful of places it could go. That's the merger doctrine in copyright. Um, West says you can't take that compilation, which includes the number of X as Vernon's list X, and publish a competing compilation. So no, people are not free to create a competing compilation mm -hmm. of Texas statutes. But the company that wants to come in, as I understand, is, has a system of their own, and they're about 10 times as large as West. At least that's what I've been told. And they're perfectly capable of developing a new system. But the problem is too many people depend on West. I think that's what you're saying. They depend on West, but the other company's big enough and strong enough so that they could develop another system of their own and become the one that was depended upon so that they can create competition if they want to. That, however, would create a lack of uniformity and citation in yeah. Texas statutory law, which is undesirable. It seems to me West is, is large. I don't know anything about comparative sizes, uh, and is capable of competing in terms of speed, accuracy, quality of work, that sort of thing. Yeah. Have any comments? Uh, I think the statute, as a general matter, uh, is in some sense penalizes success, uh, it, which is rather odd since the, the thrust of the copyright statute is to pro provide economic incentive for the production of works. Uh, it seems uh, strange that we would then turn around and reduce or eliminate copyright on the argument that the work has become too successful. I do view this as a purely commercial dispute between, if not two, a of, of small number of, of uh, publishers. And it's the kind of dispute that, in my view, ought to be resolved under general principles of copyright law as they currently exist in the 1976 statute. Thank you both very much. General Thank from uh, Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Professor Joyce, I've read all 23 pages of your testimony and uh, particularly uh, interested in your comments. Uh, uh, your analysis of the selection and arrangement process uh, of West. Uh, for example, on page 13, you state that West, ex and I'm quoting now, West exercises de minimis creativity in arranging cases within its national reporter system, <coughs> as well as de minimis creativity in selecting them. Uh, just if I may focus on the selection process and looking at federal district uh, uh, court cases, do you know what percentage uh, of district court cases uh, in this country that West publishes? No, I think the question that would be interesting is what percentage of cases which are sent by district judges and in fact do more than uh, provide a two-paragraph string site are published by West? I think the percentage would be extraordinarily high. If I were to tell you that the answer they select is less than 30 percent, would that change your view? I, I don't agree without uh, knowing more than you just told me that they select those cases. The district judges, in fact, are the 
the spigot initially which provides the flow in a great number of cases, by far the greatest number, I believe, are cut off by the district judges themselves. And I presume you'll have further testimony on this in a subsequent panel. But were that factually correct of the universe of cases uh, that 30 percent only are selected for publication, uh, you still would uh, uh, Astrotary still would assert that uh, this is uh, this constitutes de minimis creativity in arranging cases, selecting cases. As to selecting cases, I, I I don't mean, of course, to argue with you. You haven't told me on which basis the 30 percent were selected. Um, if the basis uh, is a plain and obvious basis, um, then I would think that was not selection. The, the question is not unlike the arrangement question. Um, Although I believe it's true that West does not claim, and certainly has not been recognized to have, copyright in the entire national reporter system, and I may have misheard the register on this matter earlier. Um, if it were to do so, it's clear to me from the portion of the Eighth Circuit's opinion I quote in my testimony, that what, what is being done there in terms of arrangement is purely functional and based on matters which couldn't conceivably be original. Let us separate the federal from the state cases. Within the federal uh, cases, let us separate court of appeals decisions from district court decisions. Within those, let us uh, uh, separate based on which circuit. That's nothing that was created by, uh, by West. Rob says the purpose of the Copyright Act is to spur the creation of works, is th to spur the creation of original works, and if there's originality in the selection arrangement, fine. Otherwise, no copyright. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh Professor, let, let's talk a little bit more about arrangement. Uh, also in critiquing uh, West, uh, you state in terms of arrangement that there are just a handful of possibilities. Uh, it's on page 14 now of your uh, testimony. Uh, could uh, they conceivably uh, be arranged alphabetically? Would it be possible? Surely. In fact, federal cases, the entire body of federal decisions prior to 1880 when Federal Reporter was created are arranged alphabetically. And no one suggests there's a copyright in the principle of alphabetizing cases. Could they conceivably, conceivably uh, be arranged by topic? Uh, yes. And if the topics were topics which were uh, original, not uh, uh, distinctly dictated uh, or substantially dictated by the subject matter, that'd be something else. There's an interesting case you may have seen called uh, Kluwer versus Matthew Bender, which involves um, the uh, arraying of damage and settlement uh, awards in uh, uh, tort injury cases, uh, according to body part and range of award, 10 to 25,000, et cetera. And the district court there held, I think, very correctly, that that's not original arrangement. The categories are, the possibilities are too few. And the same is true if one were to arrange cases according to uh, torts, contracts, property. No originality. They could also uh, then be arranged by issuing judges or by, uh, by judicial district, could they not? Yes, not original, but they could be arranged in that way by the name of the defendant or the plaintiff? Yes, not original, but they could be arranged in that way. By the city, by the circuit? Yes, same reply. And uh, could they also be arranged so that all opinions in a particular case, district court, circuit court, uh, or Supreme Court were together? Yes, they could. That wouldn't lead to a protection for that arrangement. Well, these are just are, are but a few of the possibilities that uh, I was able to think of. Uh, it just seems to me it's more than a handful of possibilities. Is it not? Well, I suppose handful is a term of art from the Morrissey case. I would think that that's a handful. I believe, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the record speaks for itself. I have no further questions. I just have a couple more questions. Uh, it, it's my understanding that, uh, and I think West conceded this, and the affidavits they filed with the uh, court in the West Publishing E-Data Central case, uh, in uh, affidavits submitted by the, their editor-in-chief, that uh, basically decisions, for instance, in the federal court are dictated by what the judges think should be published. They indicate what should be published. Now, that being the case, uh, is that original? No. Is that a matter of selection in your judgment? 
Mr. No. Denicola? Uh, I, as a fact of the matter, I don't know if that, if that is in fact accurate or not, but if they did publish every case that was given to them in the order they received it, there would be no selection involved. I don't know how, you know, what arrangement they were basic. I'm not talking about arrangement. I'm talking about selection, selection of cases. If the, if the judges determine, and they often indicate, you know, what is to be published, the judges do that. It is my that, understanding. That is the me. policy that's followed. Uh, is there any selection involved that is original? Uh, that's no, a question. No, I would say there would, be, there would not be under those circumstances. You could argue, I presume, that if they're arranged in a particular sequence, which was original, that there could be some degree of originality, and that would be a, a factual matter for the uh, court to determine. Circuit courts, I understand that all the circuit opinions are basically are published. Substantially all, although the uh, Tenth Circuit's opinion in Feist was not published because it was a two-paragraph uh, string cite. Um, I have no reason to think it was forwarded to anybody for publication by uh, the judges. I don't think I have any more questions. General from Massachusetts? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you have been very, very helpful to us. Uh, your, your, your full statement, which is part of the record, was excellent, both of you. And we appreciate the contributions you've made to, uh, to this very interesting debate. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Very much. Thank you. We have uh, a recess. Uh, Gorbachev. No. If you want to go, I can continue. No? Okay. Our second panel, the first from the private sector, consists of Catherine Downing, President and Chief Operating Officer of Thompson Electronic Publishing Company. Ms. Downey is accompanied by Mr. Robert D. Hurst, President, Lawyers Cooperative Publishing Company. Ms. Downey will deliver the panel's testimony with Mr. Hurst standing ready to answer questions. In her current position, Ms. Downing has the responsibility for the development, marketing, and sales of electronic products based on the legal information published by Thompson's legal publishing companies. Before joining Thompson, Ms. Downing worked for Me Data Central, where she was the senior director with responsibility for all Lexis product development and database operations. She's a graduate of Stanford Law School. Mr. Hurth's employment with Lawyers Cooperative began in 1949 on his graduation from the University of Virginia Law School. As a member of Lawyers Cooperative editorial staff, he specialized in federal and constitutional law. He is the author of American Law uh, of Products Liability. We welcome uh, both of you today. Uh, we have your statements, which we've read and which will be part of the record in full. Uh, we hope you can summarize for us without objection, however, your full statements are part of the record. Mr. Chairman, this is relevant to something I think arose when you had to temporarily absent yourself, but I just wondered whether uh, Ms. Downing has any title of nobility that we should put into the record. <laughs> <laughs> that issue arose when you were not here. Well, I Apparently can, not. I can assure the gentleman she is indeed a lady. <laughs> Welcome. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to testify before you this morning. Um, I know, I forget. We fully support H.R. 4426. Let me take uh, just a moment and tell you about Thompson Professional Publishing. That is the group within Thompson U.S. Inc., which has responsibility for the publication and sale of information to the law, tax, accounting, and professional markets. Some of our companies include Lawyers Cooperative Publishing, Thompson Electronic Publishing, Bancroft Whitney, Clark Boardman Callahan, Research Institute of America. Then why don't we just put those into the record and get right to the substance of it? Right. All right. My company, Thompson Electronic Publishing, publishes Thompson's legal information um, in electronic form, both on in online environment and on CD-ROM. The uh, advent of CD-ROM technology cre has created a very new opportunity in legal publishing and creates new access methods and opportunity for publication of legal information for the lawyers in this country. There is, however, very little of U.S. primary law on CD-ROM today. And the reason for that is the 1986 decision in the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals, West versus Mead Data Central. That decision has made it commercially impossible for Thompson or for anyone else to publish with page number citations the decisions of the lower federal courts, 
the decisional law of a number of states, including Delaware, Florida, Iowa, and the statutes in a number of states, such as Illinois, Texas, Louisiana, and Pennsylvania. I assume that the members of the subcommittee are familiar with legal citations um, and will not go into that. But it, it certainly should be noted that to participate in the U.S. legal system, a person must be able to find the decisions of the courts and the enactments of our legislatures, and that can only be done by means of the citations. You've heard already this morning from others on the majority opinion in West Publishing and its injunction against the referencing of page numbers, which constituted a, a, a distortion of the U.S. copyright law. No decision before or since has ever held that page numbers could be protected by copyright or that copyright was a means for excluding others from referencing a work. Star pagination, in fact, the reference to page numbers of other judicial reports has existed for hundreds of years and has been used by many legal publishers, including West Publishing. But I'm not here to talk about the legal theory of the West case, but rather to talk about the actual effects that the West Publishing decision has had on the publications of statutes and case law. This bill is in response to those effects. The West Publishing decision has enabled a single private publisher to monopolize the publication of lower federal court decisions, statutory law in Illinois, Texas, and elsewhere, and the appellate case law of many states. This has forced libraries and others to pay millions of dollars in monopoly charges for access to the legal text and has deprived users of the improved choices, quality, and timeliness the competition could have provided. Let me illustrate what I'm talking about with two particular examples. The first involves the judicial decisions of the state of Delaware. Many U.S. corporations, of course, are incorporated in Delaware, and accordingly, Delaware state law governs the conduct of numerous directors, officers, shareholders, insurers, and others. In the 1960s, the state of Delaware stopped publishing the decision of its courts. They are published only in Atlantic Reporter, second series from then on. Briefs filed in Delaware state courts are required by the Supreme Court rules of court to cite to only Atlantic Reporter second series volumes. That's true even for the earlier Delaware cases which were originally published by the state. The page numbers of Atlantic Reporter second series were among those covered by the injunction in the West Publishing decision. According to that decision, no one other than the publisher of Atlantic Reporter can publish the decisional law of the state of Delaware in the form that the state requires. I cite the example of Delaware because its law is especially widely cited and relied upon. Delaware case law surely would be published in the form required by the court by more than one publisher if it were possible to do so. H.R. 4426 would make this possible. The second example I wish to bring to your attention involves a publishing project which our company, Bancroft Whitney, had to abandon in the mid-1980s. Bancroft Whitney planned to publish the first new compilation of Texas statutes in more than 50 years. We planned to build this compilation from the ground up using session law sources, adding our own historical references, annotations, indexes, and all the other features which characterize our publications. The Texas Code Service was never published. Why? Because we were threatened with a copyright infringement suit and later were in a suit with a publisher of the only existing Texas statutes. That publisher contended that if Bancroft Whitney wanted to publish the Texas statutes, Bancroft Whitney would have to identify the statutes by some other names and numbers than those which have been used by the Texas courts and legislature since 1927. The publisher's copyright claim on the Texas statutory citations appears to have been bolstered by the Eighth Circuit decision in the West Mead case. Not wanting to suffer the same fate as that of the defendant in West Publishing, we abandon the Texas Code Service. To this day, there exists in Texas only one published compilation of Texas statutes. Our experiences with the Delaware judicial decisions and the Texas statutes dramatically illustrate the need for H.R. 4426. H.R. 4426 would overrule the West Publishing de excuse me, decision and enable Thompson and others to publish Delaware state law and other primary legal texts. The bill would also make possible the development and publication of new and original case reports and would accelerate the introduction of CD-ROM and other new publishing technologies. 
Enactment of H.R. 4426 would accomplish these goals without interfering with the properly protectable portions of compilation con copyrights, such as annotations and commentaries, and without interfering with organization systems developed by private companies to aid legal researchers in locating statutes or judicial decisions concerning a particular point of law. The copyright law was never intended to suppress the development of new and valuable works, yet that is exactly the result of the West Publishing decision. Without the ability to identify statutes and judicial decisions by reference to their locations and existing sources, Thompson and others are foreclosed from creating new compilations of statutes or other laws. The question raised by H.R. 4426 is not whether the standard of originality should be affected. Rather, the question is whether existing laws promoting the progress of science as the Constitution mandates. That is an empirical question as to which our nation's experience since 1986 provides a clear and undeniable answer. Existing law is suppressing, not encouraging, the publication of statutes and judicial opinions. Existing law is suppressing, not encouraging, the creation of new annotations, indexes, digests, and all other edit editorial material that typically is involved in statutory compilations. These effects of existing law are not only contrary to the purpose of copyright, but undermine a long-standing public policy to foster the publication and dissemination of our laws. Since the West publishing case was decided in 1986, no publisher has published complete texts of the Texas statutes, the Illinois statutes, the Pennsylvania statutes, lower federal court decisions, or any other primary legal texts whose citations are claimed to be subject to copyright control. H.R. 4426 would restore the law to its pre-1986 and the 150 years of law that provided for star pagination references to other case reports and make it possible for us and others to engage in the creative activity that the copyright laws are designed to foster. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. We'd be pleased to answer any questions the subcommittee may have. Thank you, Mr. Stanley. Let me ask you, in, uh, you mentioned some states. What about other states? Do you publish in other states? We publish case law in three states, California, New York, and Michigan, in print, in a number of states electronically. And the statutes in five now, are those is the difference that those are not areas where the courts of the particular jurisdictions require citation to uh, one form? In those states, the um, court rules vary, but in those states, we publish on behalf of the state the court decisions. West publishes the um, decisions of the court as well in their reporter system, and they paginate to our reporter system. And are you planning to invoke the Eighth Circuit and say that they can't do that anymore? No, we are not. And we have not. Uh, but you do that with the uh, imprimatur of the state. Are there any states that just let anybody publish who want to and don't have a uniform requirement? In terms of the case law? Yeah. Um, so did you publish there? Are there any states where you and West or anybody else who wants to publish and I'm free to cite any of several? Are there any states like that? We publish case law in a number of states using the official reporter citations where there is a competing citator. But, um, and, and you always the, use the competitor's paginations? We use the competitor's the pagination official where it exists. In one state, we publish the case law. Um, and for the last 10 years, it has only been published by West, so there's no reference to internal pagination there. All right. I mean, well, uh, you're not aware of any states where there is not an official, does every state have an official reporter? I guess we'll have to ask that. No, about, I believe the number is about half the states. All right. In the states that have no official reporter, do you, do you publish the uh, cases? We publish the cases in Rhode Island. For please, 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 please. That's a yes or no question. Yes. Then we can go beyond that, all right? I mean, I, in the states where there is no official reporter, do you publish the opinions? Yes. And does West also? Yes. Okay. So where can you not publish? Only in those states where there is an official reporter. And we're talking about cases now. We'll get to statutes in a minute. Your, your claim then is that you can't publish in those states where there is an officially designated reporter and that officially designated reporter uses copyright protection to keep you from similar pagination, the same pagination? No, there's, there's two issues. One okay. is, the first one is, we cannot publish in any state where West is the only publisher 
unless we find an alternative source to the case law. Oh, you mean the judges are, is this a case where the states give a monopoly and they say, we'll only let you publish? I mean, uh, It's a state such as in um, Rhode Island West is the only publisher for the but, last But how do they become the only publisher? The judges won't show you their opinions? I mean, aren't these public? I mean, the judge says, I wrote this opinion and I'm only giving it to West. And if you send a messenger and says, judge, may I have that opinion? The judge says, no. I'm putting it in a credit union somewhere where you can never get it again, like over your money. <laughs> I mean, is that, how, how does this work that only West gets the opinion? I'm serious. I, I don't understand this. In the, in the states where West is the only publisher in print, what has happened up to this point is that they are currently the only publisher. No, no. You're not answering my questions. Please, if you don't know the answer, the answer is you don't know the answer. And you may not know it. You, you right. don't have to anticipate. I'm asking you a very specific question. Don't, please don't respond with general information. Right. How does it happen that in the state of Rhode Island, only West gets the opinions? Do the judges refuse to give them to anybody else? You said only West publishes the opinions in Rhode Island. I mean, if you went to the judges in Rhode Island and said, may we have your opinions, we want to publish them, would they say no? No, the judges in, would say yes in Rhode Island. So then, why don't you publish them in Rhode Island? We the do. opinions. We went to Rhode Island and asked the judges for the last 10 years of the decisions, and they gave them to us, and we do publish them on CD-ROM. Well, why, why don't you publish them contemporaneously in, 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 in uh, printed reporters? We haven't, we have not made decision to publish them in print. All right, but there's no, is there any legal bar to doing it? To publishing them in print? Yeah. The, um, not if they were collected directly from the court, I don't think so, perspective. Right, so that's my question. Why is it that you can't do that? This is the issue. I mean, you're saying you want to be able to go and use West's. And the logical question West has is, hey, wait a minute, we did all this work. Why don't you do it yourself? And, the, and that's the question. I mean, I, why don't you do it yourself? The issue why don't you is go get the opinions and print them? We can go get the opinions, and we could print them as we've done on CD-ROM and publish them. Yes. The issue is what information you give the lawyers with the case law. Do you give them the citations that are required by the court? Oh, that's right. So the Rhode Island court, so that's what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. You're saying that the, the only problem is where the court requires the citations to be the West's form of citation. Absent that, you have no barrier to printing them, correct? That's Legally, right. Where correct? This, where, yes, that's correct. And in how many states does the state give that official imprimatur to one particular uh, reporter? In well over half the states and in the federal appellate right. district. Let me ask you this question, because what this is, uh, we can't control the states, but suppose, because this is the thing that bothers me. I mean, if the states weren't enforcing this, then it seems to me people could do whatever they wanted with these things. Suppose we would pass a statute which said no federal court may require citation to a, uh, that, that would implicate a copyright. That is, that the federal courts may not serve as the business getters for the holders of a copyright. Would that resolve your problem if, at the federal court level? It wouldn't at the state level, obviously. But suppose we said no federal court can discriminate. The federal courts have got to say that anybody who prints a compilation that they can accept those citations and the judges would have to, you know, be able to clean on both. I think, I think particularly when you got to the, as you increase computerization, that would be, that would be easier. Maybe they got to have too big a library or something now. But suppose we would have passed such a statute, went out the other way and said, judges may not enforce, in effect, that copyright advantage. Would that ease your problem? It, it would help prospectively, although I think there's a second question that the subcommittee would need to consider, and that is the public policy of having a number of citation systems out there and, and whether that helps the administration of justice. It would not help the 200 years of case law that exists today. Well, that's a point. But the, in terms of the future, I don't know how many there would be, and uh, it seemed to me that that would be manageable. Of course, we do have the problem that we don't have any jurisdiction over the states. But I, I am impressed. I didn't understand this before I come in. The problem really comes from the judges specifying more than uh, because if the judges didn't specify, then you would be. At, I mean, the only to the, the extent that you're at a competitive disadvantage to anybody, any other compiler, is entirely a function of judges requiring that to be the citation. Is that correct? It is the judges requiring that it be a, the citations, and that therefore it's the standard in the end. Yeah, right. I mean, oh, it's for the yes. judges that make it the standard. Congressman Frank, I think Mr. Hirsch would like to. To add something Go ahead. to that? Yeah, could I try to amplify that a little bit? The way uh, this Delaware situation, where there's now only West publishes the Delaware reports, 
the way that arose is, is typical of a number of states where, where they had official reporters that were published side by side with West for many years and then stopped publishing the official reporter. And at that point, only the West version was available. And the courts required, and in effect, gave that. Gave Before that, you could, of course, have reprinted the official reporter because that wasn't copyrighted, I assume. That we, w we would have, and we would have used pagination right. from the official reporter. We probably would not have used the same arrangement. There have been many references to arrangement of cases, and I don't want to digress, uh, uh, Congressman Frank, but I think this is important. There are, in the United States Supreme Court reports are published by the federal, by the United States government, and it's the official reports, by West Publishing in their version, and by Lawyers Co-op co in our version. All th three have the official pagination inserted, the point page. From the Supreme Court itself, the Supreme, right. But none have the same arrangement of cases. Right. They aren't the same. So the arrangement of cases is not the, the issue as I see it. It's the identification. It's the pagination. And your problem then exists. Public document. That your problem then exists where there is no, where the, where the courts don't have their own pagination, but pick up West. Exactly. In other words, if, if, where the United States Supreme Court has its own pagination, it's not a problem. Right. So exactly. Precisely. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's helpful, Mr. Ramstad. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Uh, Downing, uh, I too read uh, your complete uh, testimony and uh, elsewhere. Uh, claim, as I understand it, your claim that legislation is necessary to reverse Meade, West versus Meade, because West claims copyright uh, in citations to its various uh, legal publications. Is that a correct uh, statement? Yes, it is. I, uh, in fact, uh, have a letter uh, here that you wrote uh, to uh, association members, members of the Information Industry Association, uh, and I'm quoting now, uh, uh, prior to 1986, Legal citations, and the one you use is uh, the example you, you use is 900 Fed Second at pages one and three, were universally thought to be in the public domain. That suddenly changed, and I'm paraphrasing here, when the West versus Mead case was decided. Quoting again, in our view, the public policy which prohibits copyrights in judicial opinions and statutes equally prohibits copyright in legal citation. That precise and narrow point is all that we seek to establish by legislation. You, uh, that was your letter and your, uh, that is your position? Yes, uh -huh. Well, then my question is, uh, despite these and similar claims, uh, Ms. Downing, isn't it true that various, various Thompson uh, companies like Lawyers Co-op, Bancroft, Whitney, Clark Boardman, these companies have been freely including citations to West's uh, legal compilations, uh, literally millions of these citations for over 100 years. Isn't that true? Yes, Congressman. The, the difference in the proposed legislation and our point about citations versus what we've done in the past is this. The references to the West published documents in our information, as in all legal publishing information, is to a particular point. It is a mere reference. This legislation goes to the publication of the text of the laws or the text of a judicial decision accompanied by its citation. So it is a very narrow piece of that. There's no doubt that all of us have cited, as legal publishers, federal decisions from the West Federal Second and Federal Sub decisions for, for many, many years because those are the source of those decisions. So this is a very small piece of that. They're, they're different situations. Well, Mr. Chair and Ms. Downing, I, I'm, I'm not sure yet that I... Uh understand the problem. I've got uh, uh, one page here that uh, of, of your, uh, out of the really millions published by your, your companies, and uh, this example is taken from a uh, publication of Lawyers Co-op by the name of uh, Missouri Tort Law. And uh, on this one page, there are, as I've highlighted them in yellow, there are seven citations to West reporters, including five jump citations, uh, like to uh, Taylor versus Hitt at uh, 342 Southwest 2nd, page 489, 496. Uh, you're aware of that? Yes, uh-huh. Well, then, it seems like, uh, I hate to use the word it's misleading, uh, but I, I'm still not sure I understand uh, uh, the problem. Let me see if I can and help in terms of an example. All right. In American law report, reports where we analyze various specific issues, 
and in doing that look at the laws of the various jurisdictions. We may cite to, um, for example, a Rhode Island decision. All right? And in doing that, we will follow the traditional practice of when you cite to a particular point in a case indicating its citation number and the subsequent page upon which that point is made. And that would be consistent with the page from our publication that you have in front of you. It's been a standard in the industry. I believe that may be one issue that all the legal publishers agree on. A different example would be in Rhode Island where we publish a CD-ROM product that contains the case law in Rhode Island. For the last 10 years, West has been the only publisher of the Rhode Island decisions in print. Due to the Eighth Circuit decision, our publication of those opinions on CD-ROM do not include references to the page numbers of those decisions in the West books. So it is the combination of the citation with the text. For, or another example would be, if we were going to produce a CD-ROM in Texas, we would not, because of West claims, include the Texas statutes. So this bill is addressed to those two situations. When we have taken decisions and added value and offer them to the market, can we give them in that product the references they need to cite in the courts? So that's the specific star pagination question. And in a state like Texas, are the section numbers and headings part of the laws and in the public domain so that we can, as any other publisher could, add value and, and give to the bar and to the bench alternative ways of access to the Texas statutes. So it's very different than the citation in our publications. Does that help, Congressman? Well, Mr. Chairman and Ms. Downing, uh, let's, let's shift gears for a minute. Uh, I know uh, my, my uh, time is limited. Uh, and I'll submit the remainder of the question in writing. Let me just ask you. I'm, I'm more patient here than in our, in our subcommittee. Sure are, in a, <laughs> not my subcommittee. I've got to be nicer. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Ms. Downing, uh, I, I'm aware of the uh, major copyright case uh, you won yesterday involving your refusal to license uh, one of your competitors, Core Search. I'm referring to the Core Search case. The Thompson and Thompson and Core Search case? Yes. And the, uh, had, the, had the slip opinion when the court upheld your quote, selection, coordination, and arrangement of trademark materials. That's at page 38 of the slip opinion. I'm also uh, quoting, the court found that if, uh, uh, and now I'm quoting, Core Search was able to identify which items of information were state-generated items obtained from the 50 states in Puerto Rico. Core Search might select them and rearrange them in Core Search's own original format without violating your copyright. Isn't this exactly the same situation? that you're complaining about in regard to West and its publication? Congressman, you, if you have read the slip opinion, you know more about the decision than I do. Um, let me share with you two observations, and then if that's not a sufficient answer to your question, um, I would request that we, we get back to you with more information. There's two important distinctions, I believe, between that case and the situation that we're talking about here. First of all, that case involved trademarks, not the decisions of the courts and the laws of the legislatures of this country. So that's an entirely different subject matter. It's also my understanding that that case was, dis was decided on antitrust grounds, not on copyright grounds. But I would be happy to provide the subcommittee with additional information if that would be helpful. Well, with or without reference to the case, uh, Mr. Chairman, Ms. Downey, let me just ask you point blank. Uh, couldn't uh, you uh, create your own original format uh, in case opinions and statutes? Absolutely. The question is one of public policy and whether it serves the interest of the public to have a large number or a different number of citation systems. The American Bar Association's Committee on Patent, Trademark, and Copyrights resolution says that they believe as a public policy matter that it is fundamental that the statutory numbering schemes be considered part of the laws and therefore not subject to copyright. Mr. Chairman, I'm just going to take advantage of your uh, good graces today and uh, ask one more question of this witness. Uh, uh, I know that one of your subsidiaries, I believe it was Bancroft Whitney, uh, originally sought to challenge the uh, uh, 
principle of copyright protection for private unofficial compilations of state statutory materials in a suit uh, filed in a district court in Texas in 1985. And uh, Bancroft Whitney and his parents, parent company, Lawyers uh, Co-op Publishing Company, uh, were not successful in pursuing the uh, same goal uh, in legislation introduced in both Texas and uh, Illinois. But uh, after Thompson took control of the company, you sought uh, your company, and I don't know if the Lord had anything to do with it directly or not, Mr. Chairman, but uh, your company sought and achieved dismissal of the case just last summer, six years after suit was filed, and several months after Feist. So I, I am really uh, incredulous, and, and I just don't understand. Is it your position that Feist uh, protects West copyrights? Congressman, I would like to give you... Could you, could you um, answer yes or no? Is that your position? It is the position West has taken with us. But what is your position? Feist, is your position that Feist protects West copyrights? Our position, no. I, uh, then I don't understand why, uh, I guess, why you don't uh, pursue your case in court after the uh, Supreme Court handed down, why you didn't uh, pursue the case uh, judicially. Congressman, I would like uh, Mr. Hirsch to address this question since he was involved in the original litigation, if that would be acceptable. Yes, we uh, undertook a plan to publish the statutes of Texas after the decision of the district court in the, in the, uh, in the Mead Data Central case. And uh, at that time, we, because Mead Data Central and West involved pagination of cases, and we were talking about statutes, we thought this might, this was a, a, certainly a distinguishable issue. And we, we corresponded with the West Publishing Company and told them of our intention. And we were, the response was that if we used the, the numbers they had assigned to these public documents in Texas, they would indeed sue us. And, uh, and, the, and so, and indeed, they did sue us. We had, a, we had instituted a suit for declaratory judgment. It was removed to the Eighth Circuit. Uh, West counterclaimed and, and on, on the basis that co they had their copyright. And during the pendency of this, the decision of the Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit was handed down affirming the district court's decision. And we abandoned that suit, Congressman, uh, as a business judgment. To undertake to publish the statutes of the state of Texas is a huge com investment in, of time and money. It's a, it's a very difficult system. A very, we, had, we, were, we were adding a lot of things that West Publishing Company does not add. We were undertaking a major pub publishing effort in a, in a highly risky situation. We, we felt the decision the Court of Appeals in West and, and Mead was wrong, but that's what the, co the court said, and we decided as a business judgment when to, rather than risk the resources to pursue that, we would apply them someplace else, and that's exactly what happened. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I thank the panel. And uh, if there is anything you wish to amplify, uh, feel free. We have the record. will be open for a while. So if you can get anything further in quickly, you indicate you want to do that, you can. We will take our final panel today. Uh, uh, Mr. Vance Opperman, who's a partner in the law firm of Opperman, Hines, and Paquin, and he's the lead counsel uh, in West versus Mead. He's been counsel to West for 20 years or more. And accompanying Mr. Opperman will be uh, Ms. Donna Bursgard, who's the manager of West for Porto and Digest section, and Robert Bering, who is a consultant to West and is the law librarian and professor of law at both Hall. So they are our last panel. Oh, I'm sorry. It's not the last panel. All right. Please go ahead. Okay. Right. Mr. Oppmann, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Frank. I've been improperly identified. I'll, I'll try to, I, I realize my full statement's in the record. Yeah, without objection, your statement will be in the record. Okay. Sitting with me is Donna Bergsgaard, as manager. I've already introduced them, I believe, so why don't right. you write to your statement. Professor Baring. Uh Mr. Chairman, uh, rather than read a statement, I'd like to take a few minutes to respond to some of the issues that come up today. What you have not heard is anyone coming before you, and you will not hear it, and you haven't heard it for more than 100 years in this country, that there is a problem with access to the law. Never heard it. Mr. Ullman was here, registered a copyright, was asked a question, said material is available, and in several formats, no problem. We see the material is available. The Fifth Circuit, the Fifth Circuit, not, not the, the castigated Eighth Circuit, which I'll get to in a minute. The Fifth Circuit, in the action brought by the state of Texas, when it affirmed the dismissal in the district court, made specific notice of the fact that there is no problem with access. There is free and open access to the Texas statutes in the state of Texas. 
And while people are looking for that citation, uh, let me let me furnish that for you. That's at 882 Fed Second 177. And of course, there is no problem with access, which is the public policy question addressed by copyright. Let me take Texas, having mentioned it. First of all, we didn't sue Bancroft Whitney. They sued us. Uh, they decided, I guess we heard a few minutes ago, not to pursue the case, although they could have since Feist had already come down and they told the court they were not going to use any of the West arrangements. Fifth Circuit says no problem with access in Texas. Now, how can that be? Is it because there are states that refuse to give opinions to someone or statutes to someone? Of course not. There is no state. There is no state agency. There is no federal court. There is no federal agency we've ever heard of who's ever refused to give their materials to any publisher. And those publishers are as free as we are, as free as we are, to publish their own compilations of that material. And as a matter of fact, I, I gave the committee not a complete list, but a list of over 65 new publishing entities that have come up in this very narrow area, trying to change the law here in a very narrow area. Over 65 new publications have come up just since West v. Mead, and I gave a list of those. That's not complete. To get back to Texas, here's the situation in Texas. Texas has the official session laws, very much like the statutes at large in the United States Congress. Anyone is free to use the session laws. We publish them under separate contract. The arrangement of the session laws is totally different, totally different than the codified code of Texas. Anyone is free to publish. Anyone is free to seek the contract. As a matter of fact, Bancroft Whitney had that contract for two years. They couldn't perform. But they're free to go through the bidding process of the state of Texas and publish the official session laws. And as anybody else is free to do, they can have their own compilation of those Texas statutes. But nobody has been willing to spend the money to do that. Texas decided in 1962, 62, 24 years before West v. Meade, to go ahead and recodify their own statutes, and that's proceeding apace. It's a complicated task. It takes a lot of time and a lot of money. Money apparently the Texas legislature has wanted to spend for something else in their own decision making. But the point is, there is no problem of access in the state of Texas, as the Fifth, Fifth Circuit found, and nor could there have been, because anyone is free to use the session laws or to do their own codification, as West has done. The situation is the same with regard to case law. First, of course, there is no state that refuses to give its opinions to people who wish to publish. And there are literally hundreds, hundreds of publishers and different publications that make the, that take those cases and use them in various kinds of compilations. And we've given a short but in, incomplete list to this committee. Now, Delaware, of course, whenever you have a lawyer tell you they want to give you an example, you can be sure it's the best for their case. And you'd have, I guess, you were led to believe that, my gosh, I guess our company, and there isn't any question, there isn't any question who is the result and who is the... It's open to, for anyone to do so. You can also get it on Westlaw. You can get it, of course, in the Atlantic Reporter. You can get them on Lexus. Three sources so far, and you used to be able to get them on Verilex. Verilex was available through LCP before Lloyd Thompson and Thompson International bought Lawyers Cooperative Publishing for $810 million, along with the other 25 American publishers they have bought in the last eight years. They then phased out Verilex. So quite, quite differently than, than the impression given, there are at least three sources presently available to anyone, the law of the state of Delaware. And if there's an entrepreneur in the crowd that wants to compile that information, they can go to that state and do so, as everyone else is free to do so. Your Honor, Mr. Chairman. Not yet, and I hope never. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think people that serve in public office, frankly, do serve in an honorific position. And, and I, I recognize that there, <laughs> there are some who may feel differently, but I don't think there's anyone in this room that feels differently. The point is, this legislation is being pushed by one commercial enterprise, Thompson, previously called International Thompson. They do not want to go into Texas and do what the Texas legislature is starting to do or what we have done since 26, although they're free to do it. They want to copy our arrangement. They apparently don't want to go into states like Delaware, small states, not a large market, and they don't want to compete 
with Westlaw, Atlantic Reporter, and Lexis, they don't want to go into the court and get those opinions and put them on whatever kind of format they think they can sell. They'd like to copy ours. That's not competition. And what you heard today is, when that question was asked, Mr. Chairman, you ask it. When that question was asked, they said, well, yeah, it's true. We, we could, of course, uh, I guess we could do that. But then we wouldn't have one form of citation. What that is, is an admission by International Thompson that unlike the other American publishers, and unlike the other entrepreneurs, including all the other publishers, that have gone to the source, gotten the source, sold, sold those compilations, and done their marketing, they want to use one citation, West's. They want to do it without compensation, and they want to do it by fiat from Congress. We don't think that ought to be allowed, and that's why we oppose the bill. Thank you. I have one uh, particular question, which is, given all that you've said, the problem I then have is those situations where a court, either a federal or a state court, without a bidding process, says, oh, and by the way, you have to cite to this one situation. I, I just, what would you think about a statute where we said at the federal level you can't do that? That you have to say that it has to be an acceptable form, but you don't single out one particular commercial venture. Chairman Frank, we wouldn't oppose it. We wouldn't oppose it for the following reason. There aren't any animal, animals that that would be directed at. I don't know any court that says you can't use this citation. And as a matter of fact, as a practicing lawyer, I see this pattern. When a system comes into being, I mean, take Delaware, and someone's going to say, well, they won't accept our method of citation. Of course, we don't have a method of citation. Well, yeah, I guess that's probably true. But when there has become a method of citation that has any kind of re reality to it, any kind of reliability, courts adopt them. So you're saying that there is, and I may have gotten the wrong impression this morning, I would gotten the impression of what people have said, not being expert on it, that there were courts at the federal and state level, circuits or state courts, that required the use of a particular form of citation, i.e. page numbers and volumes. Is that incorrect? There are a few of those left. Well, uh, then I, I'm... Mr. Frank. Well, very few. It sounded uh, to me like you just said there weren't, so I'm not well, sure. Did I misunderstand your well, previous answer? Then I, mi then I misspoke. In the district courts, I believe there's one district right. court. So there are some that do. And you would have no problem then, you said, if we were to say that, that, wouldn't, that, that you couldn't do that. That's right. We would not. Okay. Because I think that's, that adds an element, uh, and I don't know exactly how much it, it, it's there, but that is uh, well, I, I don't, an element. Go ahead. Mr. Frank, I don't, think, uh, I don't think that's much of a problem because just as five years ago, and when West v. Meadland started... I, I, I really just want to answer the specific question. The other one, you said with the statutory compilations, you said in Texas that was put out to bid. Was that... The session laws, the session laws oh, were right. put out for bid. Annual. Uh, How, for what period? Three, five years, you know? I believe it's two years because I believe Texas only meets once every two years. That's right. So. Uh, we've had it for a number of years. Bancroft Whitney came in at a lower price. Got is, it, it. Is, it most, is it just dollars? I mean, if you... Do they, they just... Because I assume they have what you're talking about, at least in the Massachusetts session was, it's just chronological. Because That's in fact, right. the it's citation totally is chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 7, so there's really right. very, there's no editing. You just make sure you get it right and you, you put them in order. Totally. So, that, so it's a dollar price situation. It is, that's right. And it's a totally different arrangement, free to anyone, just yeah. as anyone is free to take those and codify them. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Ramstead. Sure, Mr. Opperman, how do you respond to the claim made earlier by a proponent of the legislation that uh, West has a monopoly uh, in the market here? Well, I've heard monopoly, joint monopoly, and oligopoly all, all in one time. Assuming that those are all the same economic um, analysis, uh, it's preposterous. And it's preposterous for the following reason. First, in any kind of monopoly uh, analysis, you would try to define the market. And I don't know of a market where you can say the West is the only source, which would be the very beginning of monopoly analysis. There isn't any. Uh, I can give you many examples. We've used the Supreme Court example. There are, my, in my testimony, you know, I forgot one. In my testimony, uh, as a practicing lawyer, I gave you the six, uh, or the seven, rather, that I know of for finding Supreme Court opinions. Actually, sitting back there and seeing Mr. Sugarman in the crowd, I'm reminded that hyperlaw is yet an eighth way, and, and the New York Times comes to my doorstep at 4.30 in the morning yet another way. There, there isn't any monopoly. There isn't any problem. There isn't any concern about access to the law, and you won't hear anyone saying there is. Because there isn't. Can I, can I add sure. a... Professor Barron. Um, one of the reasons that I think this, uh, this whole thrust is very odd is that in my, I've been in the business 20 years. I've never seen uh, such a fertile time for new publishers. 
Uh, the compact disc publishers coming on the market in various states um, have come on very strong in the last five years in a way that I think has never been seen. So, uh, in fact, things are changing quite a bit. And if I could add one point on citation. Um, uh, something was, I think, factually misspoken today. There are a number of states have given up the publication of their official reports, oftentimes because a, a state is not a good provider of information or it wasn't done cheaply enough or the state decided not to fund it. Uh, but not in those states where that's happened, that doesn't necessarily mean the state then says you have to cite to West. Uh, I did an informal study of courts a few years ago to try to figure this out. And as far as I can tell, there's only three states uh, one district court and one federal circuit that do require and take seriously a specific form of citation. It's become very loose, and I would predict it'll continue to be loose. You can even see it in the Harvard sy system of citation. Many places now even take electric citation. So it's a very fluid environment. Uh, with the you're going to, I, I want to be very precise. This is, a, to me, uh, an important point. You said there are only three states, one district court and one circuit, that require and take seriously. I just right. want to make, are there some that require and don't take seriously? I don't mean to be picky, but I... No, well, there are some that uh, I mean, would have let's a rule. Just, let's forget take seriously. Let's talk about require or uh, have, have a rule. Just the, just the ones that I know right. of. W would you submit for me a list of those? That, uh, the, you know, I don't mean to... Sure. Um, and uh, we get it all on one piece of paper, there won't be any page number questions, so <laughs> we'll have a problem of... We could copy it and there wouldn't be a problem. Um, Glad to. But I, I would like to know who, who has a specific, not a custom, but a, a requirement by, by rule, I assume it would be rule of court, not a statute anyway. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Given that distinction, I'm breathing a great sigh of relief. I would uh, ask one more question, Mr. Opperman. Uh, uh, let's assume uh, hypothetically that uh, H.R. 4426 uh, becomes law, copyright uh, protections no longer available. Uh, I know your company's faced many, many legal and commercial challenges over the years. Uh, what would a legal publishing company do to uh, ensure its uh, continued viability uh, were this to become law? Well, I was interested in Mr. Ullman's comments uh, when he said that maybe that's a policy question, that we may be in the situation uh, where the federal government or some government would have to step in and fund some of that activity. And that is, of course, what concerns us. Uh, obviously, uh, private publishers who have taken these kinds of, of uh, market positions and have put their money and time into some of these compilations, some of which have gone on for 60 and 70 years, are not going to be incentivated to do that if somebody can come along and steal it uh, whole cloth. And if that were to be the case, the first groups that would drop off would be the small states where the market's very small. Uh, I heard Professor Denicola be concerned because he comes from a relatively small market in uh, Nebraska. I think some of the other states would also not be compiled because as soon as you compiled them, somebody would steal it, uh, you'd have no protection, and there'd be very few uh, people to whom you could sell your product. I think you would not see uh, the startup, the tremendous amount of entrepreneurial activity in the CD-ROM market that, that uh, uh, <coughs> Professor Baring just talked about, and which is evident to, to anyone in the marketplace. Uh, the barriers to entry by those publishers are very low. Uh, again, they would probably be put out of business, at least on small products, municipal code compilations, compilations of that kind where there's a small but very important interest would be the first to go. Then I think the large publishers uh, would probably have restrictive uh, uh, contracts. Uh, you'd go to your top uh, 200, 300 law firms, and you'd say, you can use our arrangement by Westlaw or by CD-ROM or by our publications, but here are the restrictions. You can't use them outside the practice. You can't sub-license. You got to pay us a royalty fee. There would be a variety of contractual uh, restrictions that would, would try to return to you the benefit of your investment, but it would not be the broad access you have today. It wouldn't be that. So you'd lose access in two ways. The small guys would be out of business. They, they couldn't compete. Uh, the small states and the small compilations, which are, for example, municipal codes, uh, where there's a small market, nobody would do those, just wouldn't pay. They'd be gone. The larger uh, publishers would survive, I think, but they would use their positions for contractual protection, uh, which, would, which would limit access and make it a much different kind of environmental uh, environment for information sharing. I, I would hope that the dire prediction of then coming back here and saying, well, the people that do U.S. code can't do it anymore because it gets pirated and they can't afford it. Uh, they can't afford the tremendous amount of editorial selection, the tremendous amount of intellectual effort that goes into this. It's got to be paid for by Congress. 
and, and I would hope that would not happen, and I would hope in the various states we would not get back in the situation we were in 30 and 40 years ago where states continued to publish uh, case reports two and three years late, uh, inaccurately, but expensively, where they tried to do their own uh, uh, statutory arrangements, which took 30 and 40 years and were never completed at great taxpayer expense. I would hope we wouldn't revert to that, but I, I'd be very concerned that that would be the exact result if this kind of legislation passes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, you're finished, and we'll take our final panel now. We have uh, Mr. Bill Pravo, who is testifying on behalf of the Patent, Trademark, and Copyright Section of the ABA, which he chairs. He's a partner of the Houston law firm of Pravo, Gamble, Hewitt, Kimball, and Krieger. We have Professor Laura Gassaway on behalf of the Association of American Law Libraries, and she's taught intellectual property and is director of the Law Library at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, Stephen Medowitz is representing the Information Industry Association and is vice president and general counsel of that association. Mr. Pravo, we'll begin with you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I speak today in behalf of the Patent and Trademark Copyright... Please, please try not to repeat anything I've said, okay? I said right. that. I, I'm, let's just get right, right to the testimony. With your permission, I would like to introduce uh, uh, the person I'm accompanied by, Michael Clary, who is also with the American Bar. Certainly, and when we get to questions, if he wants to join you, that'll be permissive. The purpose of my statement is simply to bring to your attention the view of the American Bar Association Patent, Trademark, and Copyright section with respect to the <coughs> bill which is pending uh, in connection with H.R. 4426. The section of the American Bar Association met in Atlanta in August of 1991, and they resolved as follows that the section of patent, trademark, and copyright law favors in principle an amendment to the Copyright Act that would make copyright protection expressly unavailable for numbers or names by which state statute texts are identified. <clears throat> the purpose here is to support that resolution in connection with the bill which is before Congress now, H.R. 4426. There is another provision uh, of H.R. 4426, which we are not permitted to speak to, which is paragraph sub A3, and that is because our section did not take a position on that. So our support is primarily with respect to H.R. 4426, uh, section A2. <clears throat> At this point, uh, we ask that our entire statement be made of record and we thank you without objection thank you and we declare that you're, you're in support of part of part of it and neutral on the others so having no position on the others yes sir thank you uh miss gasway thank you uh, i speak on behalf of the american association of law yeah, I, I said that again please i just and right I, I want to just tell you the, the what we see the goal of our association is to increase the access of legal information not only to legal practitioners but also to members of the general public and this is a very important thrust of our statement um, the aall supports subsection a of the proposed amendment but opposes subsection b on public policy grounds because of uh, access to information um, let me speak, uh, address my remarks just to our support for subsection A and um, leave the statement as, as written for subsection B. Without objection, it will be made part of the record. Thank you. Uh, we believe that access to the law should be controlled by no one publisher, whether that control occurs um, because of uh, doing good work or because it controls, it, the control exists because a state has given its stamp um, by saying this is the statutory compilation or the report that will be cited in our courts. We have another concern in that the introduction of electronic information is not free to the public. Uh, true, we do have competing electronic formats in law uh, with Westlaw and Lexis. Um, 
but traditionally legal materials have been available in the public libraries and the public law libraries in this country to members of the general public. Uh, this will not be true to the same extent with the electronic media. They are very expensive. Public law libraries and law schools are governed by their contract, which restricts the access to materials to our own students and faculty. Uh, if members of the general public are to have this electronic access, it will be at some commercial rate. So therefore, uh, the published West materials may be the only format that is available to the general public. We also believe that citations are the signpost in the roadmap of legal research. They provide the authoritative shorthand that interconnects materials and they are the way that uh, for many, many years we have used to locate materials. Uh, the AALL does recognize the contribution that West Publishing Company has made in the publication of court reports and statutory compilations, but these are public domain materials uh, and we do not believe that citations are copyrightable. We think subsection A is narrowly drawn to deal only with the copyright status of citations. We believe the compilation themselves are copyrightable. But the assignment of volume and page and section numbers are performed after the original work uh, is done, the arrangement and the um, uh, indexing and such. So the mechanical assignment of section and page numbers we do not believe uh, is copyrightable. Um, several previous uh, witnesses have testified to what we believe one of the most serious problems is the existence in many jurisdictions of only one publisher, the requirement by the courts in that jurisdiction that citation be to these materials, and the inability of other publishers to uh, use the jump pagination in uh, their publications to make them acceptable to the court. Um, I'll be glad to answer any questions, and I thank you for letting me appear. Thank you, Mr. Menowitz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Information Industry Association urges Congress not to enact H.R. 4426. We've uh, heard a lot about public access to the law uh, this morning, and we believe that there is broad public access because of two key legal doctrines that work together. First, the statutes, the regulations, and court decisions are clearly in the public domain, the text of those materials. Secondly, there is strong copyright protection available for original compilations of these materials. And that gives incentives for that wide dissemination of this information in the format that the public finds most useful. We're concerned because, in our view, H.R. 4426 could weaken both of these aspects of current law. And therefore, unlike the other witnesses on this panel, our association is not bringing you a split decision. We feel that both Section A and Section B of proposed uh, amendments to Section 105 of the Copyright Act uh, should not be enacted. On the West versus Meade case, that's obviously a controversial case, IIA doesn't take any position on whether that case reached a proper result. But we think there are some strong arguments on legal grounds and on policy grounds against enacting legislation to overturn this decision. Uh, even after West versus Meade, the courts are free to decide on the existence and scope of protection when particular legal compilations are brought before them for decision. Congress uh, in this situation usually awaits further judicial development of the law on a case-by-case -case basis. It doesn't always do so, but we think this is a, a, a very good instance uh, for it to take that approach. There's also been a lot of discussion of the effect of the Feist decision. The Register of Copyrights seemed quite certain and quite emphatic that uh, Feist meant the death knell of the, um, of the West versus Me decision. Others have taken an opposing view. We're not so sure, but we would want to emphasize what Feist said and how this bill takes an antithetical approach. In Feist, the court told uh, the lower courts to focus on whether a compilation, a particular compilation, shows originality in the selection, coordination, or arrangement of public domain materials. H.R. 4426 would deny copyright protection to the selection, coordination, or arrangement, no matter how original it was, of certain kinds of legal materials if it's expressed in volumes and, in, and across page numbers. Uh, we think that the Congress should not reject the Feist approach. It should allow the courts an opportunity to apply the Feist approach to particular compilations that will come before them. We also mention in our statement that this is a time of extraordinary flux in the legal environment for the protection of databases and compilations generally. Not only the Feist decision, but also the pending proposal by the European community uh, for 
copyright protection for databases in Europe, which includes a reciprocity provision. So it's, in effect, a challenge to the United States to conform our law with the European proposal. All these factors can dampen uh, the investment that uh, the previous panel talked about, the, uh, the investment that's needed to, to create useful compilations. And therefore, we, we think this is not the time to uh, act to cut back copyright protection for these compilations by statute. Finally, with respect to Section B, the issue of uh, public access to public information, we're concerned that this bill is an inappropriate response to a disturbing trend, and that's the trend of increased government restrictions on public access to this information. Uh, aggressive assertions of copyright by state governments, even by the federal government in proposed legislation, and other restrictions are tending to undermine the public domain status of the underlying legal materials. We think what Congress should be doing is encouraging the states to dismantle these barriers to public access, rather than enshrining in federal law a purported right to condition public access upon payment of whatever fees the state considers reasonable. That's an open invitation that we fear far too many states would be all too eager to take up and uh, impose abusive conditions upon access to public information. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me begin with the last one. I, uh, I guess English doesn't always mean what it says, at least not to these witnesses. Uh, it seems to me to say nothing. Uh, I don't understand how people get a negative about it, but I don't think there's any problem with uh, dropping it out altogether. Um, how saying that you don't expand or reduce a right creates one. I will not understand, but I, I don't think that that's just a, a side issue of no particular importance. Um, let me ask, uh, particularly, uh, Ms. Manitza, I guess I get a little concerned when the thrust of your argument seemed to be more sort of procedural than substantive, so we should just leave it to the courts. Um, let me ask, what do you think, as a matter of public policy, uh, if there isn't much, if there is no selection, should page numbers be copyrightable? Uh, what the, as a matter of, uh, of copyright law under Feist... No, 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 see, we're Congress, we make laws. I mean, under this, over that, no, what's public policy should be? I mean, I, again, I understand it's hard sometimes for lawyers to think like people, but what people do is sometimes they say, here's this issue, and here's the way we'd like it to come out. And yes, if you're in court, you are compelled to operate within the framework of judicial decisions and statutes, etc. But to the extent that we are dealing here with statutory interpretation and not the constitutional issue, we have some obligation to say what we think public policy should, should be. But it's, to guess what a court would do seems to me to be not our primary function. Our primary function is to decide what we think the law ought to be. So that's, that's what I'm trying to say. Should there be copyright protection? Uh, now, I understand if there's selection, then I think selection is clearly an editorial function. Uh, and I think when you're talking about district court opinions, I'll print some and not others. That's a different story. But when you're talking about a uh, a compilation where there is no selection, that's the question I have. What should be copyrightable in that, in that regard? Well, I'm, as, as a public policy matter, I'm certainly not persuaded that, uh, uh, that the status quo, which recognizes protection for arrangement, in, including arrangement that's uh, expressed through page numbers, that hasn't diminished public access to the law. That's, I think, the public policy issue is, so the public do policy the people have is, access to the law? So you're in favor of copywriting uh, those things? I mean, you, you're you not asked persuaded as a policy that we, matter. Yeah, and you said you weren't persuaded that, I, I, I'm saying what you think the policy ought to be. Do you think that we should copyright, as a matter of law, pagination uh, of compilations where there isn't any uh, selection in, involved? I think if it reflects an original arrangement of the material, yes, it should be protected by copyright. What would you mean by original arrangement? I mean, if uh, we're not talking about selection. I'm, I'm literally, these are the kind of issues that we're talking about, you know, deciding where you cut off the page or how you do it, double column or single column. I mean, literally, these are the, you know, because if, if you were printing, I understand if you're printing some opinions and not others, I think that's a different story. But where you're printing every opinion, what what would be copyrightable in that regard? Uh, th then you'd have to look to whether the arrangement was uh, showed sufficient originality, right. which is, was it copied from somebody else and did it have a modicum of creativity or was it purely mechanical? If it was simply, routine? right, so that, if it was purely mechanical and not very and not selective, then if you would not think If it's purely mechanical that... and purely routine, then it should not be protected. But okay. of course, this bill would go far beyond that. This would. I understand protection. that, but you understand too. We're not restricted to passing or. Yes. I mean, we don't vote yes or no. You start with it, you amend it, you discuss it. So, I mean, that's that's the. Uh, it, it's as I said, the public policy uh, 
uh, situation. Let me ask again, uh, Mr. Pravon, Ms. Gasway, because you would have more on saying this. I'm, I'm left unclear here as to how many jurisdictions do, in fact, certify that this particular form of citation shall be followed in submissions to this court. Do you have any sense of that? And, and, and what would you think about us saying you can't do that where it's uh, – where it's copyrighted, but that any any reasonable form of citation should be used. Ms. Gassaway? I like that idea. Uh, as another way to address this, um, I, I, like you, gave some thought to, you know, what is original in page numbers as you begin to look at some of that. And I wanted to tell you that I did at one time in my career know of some original volume numbering. Back in the late 1960s, Matthew Bender came out with a series uh, in which the volumes were numbered by symbols such as diamonds and circles and stars. Those were original. No one knew how to shelve them in a library. Well, that, was that for the purpose of copyright? Or? No, I have no idea what the purpose was. And fortunately, they learned the errors of their ways and went back to its sequential Arabic numbers. <laughs> but there was one time I saw original volume numbers. I've never seen original pagination. I, it, not relevant to anything, but I, was, I guess I was naive. I, I, miss, I, I guess I, I should have realized that Arabic meant only as opposed to Roman, because when right. I went to Egypt for the first time, I was surprised when I couldn't read the number on the door of my room because they don't write Arabic numbers the way we write Arabic numbers. And, <laughs> hey, they're the Arabs. They're entitled. They, they, we're wrong. They're right. I was disappointed when I, I couldn't recognize any of the numbers. Uh, Mr. Powell, um, is that widespread? How widespread is it? Uh, and, and let me ask you another question, too, because I shouldn't be too formalistic. I realize that in some cases it may be required, but custom can have the force of law in our society, particularly among people in the common law tradition. Are you disadvantaged as a practicing lawyer in many jurisdictions if you don't cite to the prevailing reporter in that, in that jurisdiction? Do you have any particular sense on that, Mr. Powell? Well, if you have a place where you can find a case, of course, you're not disadvantaged. Uh, but there may be a disadvantage with respect to the provision that we are talking about here in the bill, uh, which would if you were precluded from citing the name or the place where you could get that particular statute, then you would be disappointed. Yeah. Um, uh, the chairman has returned, uh, Mr. Hughes. I'm through. I just have a couple questions. Uh, Mr. Preble, both in your oral and your written statements, uh, note that while the ABA supports H.R. 4426's denial of copyright to uh, statutory names, numbers, and uh, citations, it abstains from the bill's denial of copyright for the volume or page numbers for regulations and opinions. I wonder if you can share with us the uh, legal distinction between these two categories of materials. The legal distinction between the two paragraphs that we're talking about here in the bill, is that yeah. the question? Well, the, okay. thank you. Thank you. obviously the uh, first paragraph, number two, relates to the statutory uh, names. <clears throat> no, no. Talking about the two categories of materials. Uh, in other words, you in your, in your oral and written statement note that the ABA does support H.R. 4426's denial of copyright to statutory names numbers and citations, but it abstains from the bill's denial of copyright and the volume or page numbers for regulations and opinions. Well, the basis for the abstaining is because our ABA section has not studied that or taken a position that we can assert here. Uh, the, the first uh, part of it, which we support, is based upon the fact that names and numbers of statutory text should be permissible use and not uh, subject to copyright. They shouldn't be precluded. That uh, would appear to be a limitation that shouldn't be in the uh, present uh, way of dealing with statutory matter. Okay. So you basically, basically did not focus in on that, that issue, and that's why you abstain. It's not any that's basis. Correct. No, there's no legal basis for abstention. That's correct. Uh, Professor Gassaway, you, you acknowledge yes. on page 8 of your testimony that the private code systems clearly are intellectual accomplishments which, and I quote, ordinarily would be copyrightable, quote. You go on, however, to give a number of reasons why copyright should nevertheless not be available. Aren't you concerned that if copyright protection is not available, no private publisher will undertake the expensive and time-consuming process that is required to create a compilation of statutes? 
there is some concern about that, but of course there are some states in, when there, in which there is an official statutory compilation, and so the state has undertaken that. The, the more serious issue, I think, for the AALL, of course, is the states where there is only one, and so there is a, a stamp that is given, or a, a, an emphasis, to this private publisher that creates uh, a disadvantage for the market. And we think that the broad market is beneficial to members of the public as they try to use legal information. As you uh, also point out in the past, private publishers stepped into the breach caused by states' yes. failure to develop their own code systems. Yes. Having provided a valuable public service by doing what a state should have done themselves, but didn't, doesn't it seem unfair to come along and now say, in effect, thanks? Your work is great, so good, in fact, that we're going to expropriate it. I don't think that anyone is, is um, recommending that the entire work be expropriated because there is work in the editorial comment, some of the historical notes, et cetera, that would be copyrightable. The text of the statute itself, and indeed once the state has adopted that official uh, arrangement, then that really becomes state action in effect. And that's all that the AALL believes should not be subject to copyright, not any of the traditional elements that compilations protect. Uh, Mr. Metallitz, on page four of your statement, you indicate that the 2A does not take a position on whether the West Mead decision was correctly decided. That's correct. Yet on page 13, you state that H.R. 4426 would eliminate copyright for a valuable feature of legal compilations. Aren't you, in fact, taking a definite position that West v. B. was correctly decided by declaring that protection is being eliminated? By the way, the 2A submitted an amicus brief, in, for, in fact, didn't it, in, in the case? We did not in the West v. Mead case. Uh, we did it in the Feist case, no. yes. Do um, you re recall favorably citing West v. Mead? On page 17 of the brief? We did comment on the, uh, the fact that the petitioners in that case had um, uh, described West versus Meade as a sweat of the brow decision, decision under the sweat of the brow doctrine, and we uh, disagreed, saying that from reading the case, it appears to be but, an application. But you cited it favorably, did you not, in that case? We cited it as an example of the selection, coordination, or arrangement approach to, uh, uh, to, to compilation copyright, and we disagreed with the characterization that had been made of it by some of its opponents. So I guess if the enemy of your enemy is your friend, maybe we did cite it uh, favorably in that I sense. I wonder if you can explain to me how, how H.R. 4426 removes compilation protection that West versus Meade protected. And please describe precisely what West versus Meade in fact, properly protected. Well, Mr. Chairman, if I can go back to your earlier question, maybe this would, would help to answer it. H.R. 4426 goes far beyond, in our view, overruling West versus Meade. It does overrule West versus Meade, but it does more. It says that no matter how original your selection, coordination, or arrangement of these legal materials that you express in volume numbers and in pagination, no matter whether that's clearly original under Feist, we're still going to deny protection to that. Now, in the West versus Meade case, the court had to look at a particular compilation which was selected, coordinated, or arranged in a particular way. And these factual questions that we've heard about this morning, did, did West uh, simply publish everything that came in through the door? Did it simply go in chronological order? How did it organize this material? Those became the, extremely relevant and indeed the, the basis for that decision. Uh, we're not taking a position on whether the court was correct in finding that there was enough originality in how West arranged the cases in their national reporter system. But we do object to the, uh, uh, the assumption in the bill that no matter how original your arrangement of cases, it should not enjoy copyright protection. Okay. Well, given uh, the Feist decision, uh, what do you think a court hearing a case raising the identical issues then? West versus Bede would be decided today. Mr. Chairman, I frankly don't know how they would decide it. Uh, the Register of Copyrights said earlier that clearly they would decide it, uh, they would decide it differently. Uh, Professor Joyce in his article uh, said that the only justification for the West versus Meade decision is the sweat of the brow doctrine, and since the Supreme Court has, has eliminated that in Feist, 
uh, that would mean the death knell of the West versus Meat. He, he may be right. I don't know. But I think the court should have an opportunity to apply the Feist test to particular compilations that come before. Let me try to approach it another way. Since you can't say whether a court would reach a contrary result, I understand that. Will your members invest in an online computer or CD-ROM service that offers star pagination to West reporters without getting West permission and paying whatever licensing fees that they demand? That's a business decision that our companies would have to make. There's obviously an element of legal risk there. There is a, the West versus Meade decision is still on the books. On the other hand, uh, while it's been very controversial in academic circles, no court of appeals has adopted it other than the Eighth Circuit. So that would be a decision that they would have to make based on all the factors. Governor Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Travel, if I may ask you, I uh, hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, uh, question the uh, resolution upon which you base your testimony. That's merely a resolution of the uh, section on patents, uh, copyright, and trademark law. That's not the entire ABA. It's not the entire ABA. That's correct. Although uh, the, the American Bar Association does provide this vehicle for the section, which in this case is made up of about 10,000 members. But when you talk about ABA support, you're referring to this uh, section endorsing this resolution. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, and um, are, are you, uh, this 1991 resolution, again, upon which you base your testimony, do you recall who uh, chaired that subcommittee that uh, brought that resolution forward? James W. Dabney. And uh, isn't it true that Mr. Dabney was also the main speaker, the main proponent of, of this resolution at the convention of the section? Well, he certainly was the presenter of it as the chair of that subcommittee, yes. Is this, uh, to your knowledge, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Uh, Pravel, is this the same Mr. James W. Dabney, who is the attorney representing Thompson uh, on this bill, as well as the same uh, James W. Dabney serving as counsel, who served as counsel for Meade in the West versus Meade case? I'm not sure whether he represented uh, Meade in the West case, but he is, as I understand, at the time this resolution was drafted by the committee from the American Bar Association Patent Trademark Copyright Section, he was uh, not involved in that drafting or on that particular committee. But you're aware of Mr. Dabney's uh, involvement uh, representing Thompson? I understand he does represent Thompson, but he wasn't at the time that was drafted. Well, Mr. Chairman, for the record, I'll submit a documentation confirming his representation on both counts. Not, and I understand that it was 1991, and perhaps you didn't have direct knowledge. I certainly can understand that. Um, Let me ask, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, just a couple questions, by may, of Ms. Uh, Gazaway. Uh, uh, what, in your judgment, and you obviously have a great deal of expertise in this area, if, uh, let's say, hypothetically competing uh, publishers were allowed to reproduce the uh, legal compilations of other publishers, that is the selection, coordination, and arrangement, as we talked about today, of the uh, uh, public uh, domain material, isn't it likely, uh, since copying uh, nowadays is surely a lot cheaper than creating, that the market for the original compilations will be uh, totally destroyed? Certainly, and the AALL does not support a position that says copyright and compilation should come to an end. We simply support that citations to compilations are in the public domain. So, so you, you, you agree that, uh, we're, um, that, that, that the market for original compilations would be destroyed if... Uh, the, uh, any statute were to go further, that is, to uh, selection, coordination, or arrangement of the public domain material? If not destroyed, certainly harmed. Uh -huh. Certainly harmed. Just a couple other questions, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Uh, really? Ms. Gasaway, uh, uh, do you know of any instance uh, where a publisher has objected to the use of citations uh, to its publication? Well, we did hear one today. Other than one today. <laughs> Uh, we have heard some apocryphally. I don't personally know because I'm not involved in publishing, but in legal education. So I'm sorry I don't know any personal examples. I, uh, it's my understanding of West's position that it, uh, it actually encourages the uses of its citations uh, 
uh, to its publications by other publishers. Uh, is that uh, your understanding? Uh, it certainly does not seem to encourage the use of jump pagination or star pagination without payment of license fees, which would mean it has some sort of, uh, that it believes it has some sort of copyright or some other interest in the page numbers. But do you know of any situation where Wes has objected to the, uh, to the um, use of its citations? To its publication? Well, the citation includes the pagination and the jump pagination. But as opposed to the star pagination uh, uh, that it objected to in West versus Mead. No, but that's, the, that's certainly the, the big instance. Uh, if a competing publisher cannot use the pagination to the standard format that is required as citation in court, then uh, why would other publishers begin to try to do it once there has been a decision and an agreement uh, for a license fee with that. Well, so is your answer no with that exception? That no, but that is a huge exception. <laughs> it's not a little exception. It's a big exception. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to, without objection, your, uh, your submission will be received uh, in the record. I just want to clarify something, Mr. Preble. I understand that there were 28 members on uh, Committee 308. That's correct. Okay. They actually drafted Resolution 308-1. Yes, that committee was responsible for drafting it. How many of them participated, uh, we don't know, but they were all involved and all permitted to participate. Just as a follow-up uh, to what my colleague from Minnesota was alluding to relative to the membership that uh, had some interest because of an affiliation with Thompson. I understand that there were five members of that particular committee that had some affiliation with West, four with Thompson, and 19 unaffiliated. Do you have any knowledge? That is my information as well. All right. I wonder if you can check that and submit it for the record. We will certainly try to do that. It sounds to me like it was pretty balanced there at the committee. If that's my opinion. <laughs> And I gather that, that uh, the resolution was adopted by some 16,000 members of the section? Well, no, the section only has uh, about 10,000, a little more than 10,000, I believe, at this present time. Uh, you're talking about the vote. The way we vote yeah. and... So tell me how, how it was reported out of the section. Out of the section. The section actually proposed the resolution. The resolution then was placed on the floor at the annual meeting in Atlanta uh, where all anybody that's in our section was permitted to attend. At that particular meeting, we had, I believe, in the neighborhood of 200 of our members present and uh, voting on this resolution. We don't have a record as to the number who have voted in favor of it, but normally if it's a close vote, it is recorded. All right, well, thank you very much. I, I want to apologize for having to slip out twice, but we had a markup in another committee, a markup being reporting out legislation I had to be present for. And also, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev is here in Capitol Hill and just uh, addressed uh, the Congress over in the Capitol Rotunda, uh, in the statutory hall, really. And so that's the reason a number of members uh, left during this process. And I say that uh, because there are a number of questions that I, that I have wanted to direct to two of the panels, panel uh, two and three, that I did not get around to. And I'm going to leave the record open for 10 days, and I'm going to direct those questions and ask if the panels will respond within 10 days. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I assume the uh, same privilege applies to the minority members. Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, well, I've asked, uh, I've asked them the, uh, in fact, uh, if any members on the committee, including the gentleman from Minnesota, that. Uh, if he happens to have missed any questions, which I doubt, uh, <laughs> he has been very attentive to the hearing. But if he had missed any, that I'm, then the gentleman will have the opportunity to submit those questions. Thank you. It's been a very, very interesting hearing. It's an interesting issue. Um, and uh, the panels have really provided us with excellent testimony. The statements uh, were very comprehensive and very helpful. We appreciate uh, your testimony here today. Thank you very much. That concludes the testimony, and the subcommittee stands adjourned. I'd like, I'd like to
stimuli, stimulated. Well, yeah. 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 Excellent. Here, right? Cool. Thanks a lot. Oh, okay. I really appreciate that. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm going to tell you. I want to put your mind. Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, uh, I am my. That's the thing. Nice to hear. Nice to hear. Well, see you at the airport. You're a good man. Thanks. Rest easy. Thanks a lot. We're going to. It's kind of fun. Good here. I'm not satisfied. Uh, I don't read. I don't read uh, I used to, uh, some people. I just can't read. Uh, read. Uh, it's a lot different. See ya. But, you know, I'm not sure that this is something that can't be decided as a topic of football. Give me a presentation. That's a question I have to me. But this is uh, this area. And I want to get it down for sure. But there is no commitment to move anything forward. And I'll talk further about it. Thanks. Okay? Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you.